All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. So first and foremost, Dr. Metzler, thank you so much for coming in today. So just as a very quick introduction, I mean, we'll welcome to North Reading. Um, we appreciate you traveling here. Appreciate you considering you know, the, the job here. I think everybody on this board has started to learn how, uh, how difficult the job of superintendent is. And so for anybody to actually want that job is, is honestly amazing to me personally. And so <laughs> I, I do appreciate the application and you know, even considering us. So um, just going to do a quick little outline of how we're going to do things today. So we asked you in the very beginning to prepare you know, an opening statement of a few minutes. Uh, specifically touching upon you know what your vision would be for North Reading in the next five-year strategic plan after that rather than just peppering a million questions we've decided to group questions and, and topics into five different areas based primarily on the responsibilities of the superintendent each of us will lead one of those discussions plan on it being about 10 minutes we'll start with you know a couple of questions that we've prepared in advance and after that, just kind of back and forth. We really want this to be an interactive process and kind of go from there. I'll serve as a bit of the moderator and the timekeeper. And that's about it. So if you want to begin, you know, I'd just like to hear, you know, your opening statement and maybe a little bit about what your vision would be for North Reading. Um, and specifically, you know, if we had a five year strategic plan, what would be some of the themes that you think should be in it? Great. Well, first, I, first I want to say thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for the opportunity, um, you know, to interview uh, for this position. I also wanted to thank, uh, thank you for making me feel welcome. Uh, it, uh, the first interview uh, was a great group, and I felt um, I felt comfortable, and, and, and that only made this job more appealing. Uh, as, as, in terms of an opening statement, I, I feel like, um, you know, in, in respect to my career that I've been preparing for my entire my entire career, I've been preparing for the next opportunity or this opportunity. Uh, as I said the other evening, um, you know. Uh, I was a, I had a lot of teaching experience, moved on to middle school principal, high school principal, had an opportunity to be a superintendent with the intention of returning to the right district in Massachusetts at some point. Um, I'm entering my eighth year. I didn't plan on being there for eight years. Uh, I started with a three-year contract. End of year one, they made it a five-year contract. Shortly after that, they asked me to stay for 10 years. Um, and so I, I, that was not my intention. My intention was to return to Massachusetts to the right, the right school district. So I've been very selective in terms of school districts that have openings. Uh, as in respect to uh, North Reading and my vision, um, and I, I gave this some thought after I received the email, and, I, and really, uh, it's really our vision. It's not my vision in, in, in respect. Um, I have, I do believe it's value added that I, you know, looking at your strategic plan, um, clearly teaching and learning uh, would continue to be a focus. You know, where are there places to add value? Uh, for me, you know, I looked at, I, I think student voice, I, I place a great emphasis on student voice, um, the customers, if you will, how they feel about teaching and learning, looking for the appropriate vehicles for them to be able to share how they feel about their classroom experience, looking for the appropriate way to work with the unions and the administrative staff uh, so that we somehow can incorporate the changes that we make based on how students feel about teaching and learning. Uh, that's important. You know, your technology integration, that's certainly um, something that you spent a great deal in this, in this current strategic plan. Uh, you know, that would be something that obviously some of these are, 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 they don't end at the end of a strategic plan, they're works in progress, if you will. And the final piece of, you know, your student services piece. So, uh, and I don't, I don't suggest for a minute that some of these things that I'm going to talk about are not happening, but my vision really, you know, once again, I, I talk about student verse, so uh, student voice, you know, wanting to make sure that we put kids first, um, looking at equity versus equality, looking at the distribution, are we working smart with the, the resources that we have? Um, and I'm sure you are, but you know, looking at you know, is is equity you know which should be a focus, um, you know, and then and then creating appropriate vehicles to appreciate and celebrate um, not only student achievement but diversity. So in terms of strategic planning, working directly with the administrative staff through the unions, through support staff, uh, and right down to the students, and uh, making sure that that those kind of systems that are in place so that we can improve teaching and learning that leads to. Uh, high student achievement that, that leads itself to or lends itself to opportunities for students that go well beyond. You know, people would say, how would you know if you're successful? For me, it's about when students come back to talk about the opportunities they had, primarily because of the preparation that was 
in North Reading from K through 12, uh, that's how you know you're successful, when students come back and, and share those opportunities uh, that they were afforded um, based on uh, the preparation here. Uh, that, that's now after, you know, going into my eighth year, you know, having students come back and talk about their experiences beyond, you know, did we do a good job? You know, if you, um, if you fully engaged here, was there any opportunity that was not made available to you? Um, and, and, and more times than not, kids will talk about, or students will talk about, not applying themselves, but the instructional staff and the people that worked here provided every opportunity. Um, and so I think that's how you, you, you think about success. And so in terms of strategic planning, um, for me, uh, you know, trying to keep it in terms of teaching and learning and about student achievement, th those would be my focus <coughs> points, but you know, trying to branch out a little bit with student voice, diversity and equity versus equality. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, so for our first theme, I think we're going to go to Rich about student learning. I was going to say, speaking of student learning, uh, that's where we're kind of starting off here. So um, welcome again, Dr. Messler. Um, so how can a district support all learners in a classroom without penalizing any of them? So by all learners, I mean all learners of all levels. Well, I think the, the important thing, it's, it's philosophically embracing the, the concept that, that people can get smart, they don't have to be born smart and that you provide equal access to the curriculum for all students. So, you know, so for me, in terms of teaching models and, and taking a look at, at what we do, you know, we have content specialists and you have modification specialists. And I've always said, you know, modifications that are, that are made for special needs students or for gifted students are good modifications for all students. So I, I think it starts at the top. I think it starts with the school committee, uh, with your goals, through the superintendent's goals, to the building level goals. Uh, making sure that we support all learners and that really gets back down to equity as we look at the distribution of resources or programs or any kind of support that we get that we make sure that we use we work smart with the resources we have and when I talk about equity it's making sure that the students that need it most have it now that's not to suggest that that's just for students that struggle or just for gifted students but to really work smart uh, from the school committee on down through the superintendent to the administrative staff and teachers uh, and support staff to make sure that we're using the resources, um, we're working smart, and we're making sure that, uh, that the kids that need the resources have access to them. Can you give any examples of uh, ways you've, which you've achieved some of that in your districts? Well, in terms of equity, in, in, uh, you know, if you look at, um, for instance, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the tripod survey. So if, if we look at, um, at how students feel about teaching and learning, and um, if, for instance, I had a building that um, students in that particular building didn't feel that the teachers were compassionate enough, you know, I would, I would look to use resources in terms of professional development, again, self-reflect, self-select. We're going to self-reflect on the fact that the students don't feel that we're compassionate enough. We're going to make sure that we make professional development available to staff so that we can um, be more compassionate in the way we deliver. Um, a similar, uh, similar evidence would be if the students didn't feel we were challenging enough, there wasn't enough rigor and perhaps we would be working for the instructional staff in terms of rigor. I talked a little bit about this the other night, so I don't I feel like I'm repeating That's myself, okay. but I know this is a different interview. Yep. Um, you know, looking at, at how students feel about teaching and learning and making sure that the professional development that we provide staff, that staff on an individual basis can self-reflect and self-select, and that's very personal. That's not used to evaluate them. That's really a personal kind of self-reflection and self-selection in terms of PD. But if there are themes throughout buildings or throughout the district, that we make sure that that, that particular building it's made available to or, that particular, or the whole district, if that's the case. Um, obviously, that would be an alarming kind of, if, if the entire district felt that we weren't compassionate. Um, you know. But again, you know, finding the appropriate vehicles to solicit that kind of information, you know, those surveys. You know, yep. Is Tripod the right survey for North Reading? I don't know that. Um, it was the right fit for the, the districts that I'm working in, in terms of trying to solicit uh, student voice and, and to, get, to get the customers to let us know kind of how they felt about teaching and learning. There was some apprehension initially from, from unions because they thought we were going to use that to evaluate them, and that was not the case, and it's not used to evaluate staff at all. It really is to evaluate teaching and learning and then to provide the kind of support and professional development for staff uh, so that we can make sure that, um, that teachers can get better at, 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 at what students feel they need to get better at. Um, yep. in, a, in a really, um, I, I think in a, I don't f find it invasive and I don't find it threatening in any way. Uh, and, and we've had full support in, in both districts with that. So how, how did you address that with con those concerns with staff as you were implementing some of the, or as you were rolling out some of the survey data? Well, it comes down to trust. Yep. So it's, it's trust and verify, right? So, 
you know, you spend a lot of time meeting with unions and, and explaining exactly your plan to get buy-in. Um, you need buy-in. And so, um, you know, having an idea of what we were going to use the information for, for school action plans, which are school improvement plans in Massachusetts, yep. use a different, <coughs> doing a lot of Massachusetts work in New Hampshire, at least in my districts. Uh, um, so our school improvement planning or our school action plans um, will typically have one of these goals that mm. it's from this, this student voice. Uh, uh, so I think that's important. And then, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it comes down to trust. So you tell them you're going to do something and then if it plays out that way, you can build on that trust and you can go a little further. Um, you know, um, you're going to have people that are somewhat, that can feel cynical in a sense uh, about it initially, thinking, oh, this is gonna be used to evaluate us. Um, I would meet with individual teachers that may be struggling, um, and I wouldn't even have their data in front of me, but I would say to them, what did the tripod survey tell you? What are students telling you? Um, and they were like, well, you have access to that data. I said, I only look at it at the building level and the district level. I told you I don't look at it at an individual level. Mm -hmm. And my school board wanted that information, which I said, that's not, that's oh, not appropriate. It's really, that was not, I gave my word that we would not do that. Yep. We're not doing that. So, um, and so the schools would have an action plan that would address a particular area and the district we would and my goals certainly would address anything that students brought up as a, as a concern or something that we needed to work on so um, that's just a quick example about one way to do it um so i'm a classroom teacher in a in a neighboring town and uh in the classroom i often hear from students that a negative consequence of standardized testing is that it can disrupt classroom learning and routines uh, as superintendent, how do you go about minimizing that impact, or how would you do that? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. You know, as far as, um, you know, there are obviously multiple measures to, to try to um, determine whether you're successful in the classroom or not. You know, standardized testing, you know, I, I started, right when I started, um, I said, let's, let's test less and teach more. Um, you know, so we have mandates from the state that we have to do certain things, but we needed our own kind of universal screening device so that we could, we could goal plan. and then, and then try to use data or use data appropriately to change teaching and learning. So part of it is a competency-based model and we're more of a hybrid than, you know, some districts have gone straight competency-based and, got, and gotten away from. Uh, we certainly don't teach the test. However, uh, in programs like advanced placement programs, AP programs, you know, um, you know it's, it's about teaching in the spirit uh, in which the curriculum was devised. Obviously, there's a, there's a test that goes with that. Um, you know, SATs are important, ACTs are important those sorts of things. So I think there's a delicate balance there to respect the teacher's kind of autonomy, yet on the same token have a, a district approach that doesn't overemphasize test results. But test results are important as well. So it's just one of the measures that we use um, so that we can figure out what we're doing well and what we need to work on. One of the things you hear a lot um, in a, a lot of districts is, um, you know, we, we use data-driven decision making. And I think for us, um, for me, when we talk about data-driven, I, I want to know what instructional practices we've changed. It's easy to identify weaknesses and strengths, but you know, what changes have we made, and are those changes contributing to, um, you know, to increase student achievement? But I think, I think it's it really comes down to uh, what are your core values, you know, uh, as a district. You know, do they do the do the students understand? Do the teachers understand? Do the parents understand? Parents understand? You know, what's important to that particular district? I think the school committee helps drive that. Uh, I think your administrative staff, your parents help drive mm -hmm. that. Uh, there are communities that, that that's the most important thing in that particular community. So I think as, as North Reading defines what's most important to them, you know, it's, it's, it's my job to help, um, to help lead that uh, and make sure that it gets all the way down to the classroom and to the kids. And so I would hope that this district wouldn't overemphasize um, standardized testing. Um, but we also know that it is one of the measures uh, that, that we need to make sure that we pay attention to because it will provide itself to opportunities for students well beyond their years here at North Reading. Right. Anybody else have any questions on this area you want to dig into? I think, I'll ask one, follow, one final question. I think you've addressed it a little bit, but one thing that our current superintendent has been very adamant about is providing opportunity to take tests like AP classes that, you know, compared to some neighboring districts, sometimes our AP scores are not as high, but the number of students taking the AP test is tests are far more and so where do you come down on that I mean do you think it's good to challenge them to let them take the test or would you think that you'd be more limited in who should be able to take those exams well this is this is a great question I thank you for asking if you were to ask me this question <coughs> differently what is one of the things you're most proud of in your career this would be one of them so um, when I went to North Quincy uh, there were the gatekeepers you know certain students could only take AP classes and you had to get by the gatekeepers to actually get in the class 
So my um, directive to staff was I wanted every student in that building to take one class, one level higher than they were accustomed in an area that they considered a strength, which meant a lot of students that were in, in standard classes mm -hmm. would take an AP class in an area that they thought was a strength. We tripled um, the number of students that were taking those, those classes. I also wanted everybody in those classes to actually take the AP exams, um, and that was part of you know, a one or a two on the AP, you have qualifying scores, you need to get a three to have a qualifying score, four is a good score, five is a really good score. Um, even really right students need to be challenged to get qualifying scores on AP exams. So um, philosophically for me, it was I wanted as many students in those classes, and I certainly wanted, um, I talked about the fact that we can't handpick kids and then celebrate some high percentage. Let's talk about, Let's talk about purifying the program. Let's get more kids into the program. Let's get all the kids. Um, and, you know, we might have to make some changes in terms of who's teaching these classes at some point, uh, you know, to make sure that they're delivering the curriculum in the spirit which was which intended by the college board. Um, but I think in, in, at North Quincy High School, we were very successful. Um, you know, at one point they were handpicking kids, but we, we took a percentage from about 80%. I cautioned the school, uh, the, the leadership in the school. I said our percentage will come down, but we'll have <coughs> far more qualifying scores. Um, you know, the, the second piece of that was they did the exact same work at Timberlane. So we tripled the number of students actually taken. We, we opened the gates and we want as many students taking these opportunities and also talking to them about um, this is what rigor looks like, this is what a challenge looks like, so more students, um, more qualifying scores. And in both cases, we were able to get those numbers up close to 80% of students getting qualifying scores and yet having more students in those, those programs. Now my guidance counselors at the point where they cautioned me with that early directive, you know, you're gonna force all these kids into these challenging courses, they're gonna struggle and they're gonna drop down. It didn't happen, it didn't happen. We were able to increase, like I said, uh, by about 20% in both cases, um, number of students in those classes. So that's one of the things I'm most proud about. Again, I think it's, um, it's about equal access. You know, so we were at a point in both districts where kids didn't have access and now more kids have access to that challenging, uh, rigorous curriculum. Again, core values, right? So rigor is one of the core values in, in the districts that I work in, uh, and it's one that the community has embraced, and, and certainly the student population has as well. Thank you very much. Okay, why don't we move on to the management sure. section. Chris, I think you're gonna lead this. Uh, yeah, so as Scott just said, the section will revolve around management of uh, personnel and, uh, and, and people working for you in the district. Uh, my first question is this. It, if the district were to decide to purchase online curriculum and a large percentage of teachers resisted the change, how would you go about cultivating buy-in? Uh, good question. Well, first of all, um, you know, working with a school board or a school committee, you know, my job is, is to advise um, and then execute, right? So we have our discussion and we, we decide what we're going to do. I think, I think any initiative, so whether it's online classes, whether it's distance learning, uh, which is in your strategic plan, right? So strategic plan is crystal clear to staff, it's to be crystal clear to the superintendent, certainly crystal, class, uh, crystal clear to the community. Um, it's, it's, again, buy-in. So I think, you know, at some point, um, you know, you, you spend as much time trying to explain, but it, it's about the execution of. So um, if you have people that resist, you know, uh, typically you have to show value, right? So again, you're showing where the value is uh, while we're doing this. I think sometimes that, and then try to figure out what's the resistance for. Is it, are we worried that we're going to need less teachers if we do more distance learning. Um, you know, is, is, wh where is the resistance coming from? Is it, is it just an old mindset? Is it you know, trying to teach an old dog new tricks? Is it, um, so I, th I think that that's important. But again, I think it comes down to trust and relationships. So um, if you're making change, um, I think buy-in is very important. You, know, you can't do things to people, you need to do them for them. And so um, you know, my hope would be that we'd have a significant buy-in on the front end of this. Now, Again, it comes down to leadership style again. So, um, you know, I, again, I look at that in four quadrants. I look, you know, traditional in nature when it comes to safety and security, but uh, participatory when it comes to anything that's going to touch the classroom. You know, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a player's coach and I was a former teacher. So, um, you know, that was important to me that the administrative staff and beyond understood our work in the classroom um, and, and what it meant. So I think um, that's important, you know. You consult when you don't know. So if there are experts that would help, if, if it's something that I couldn't do, I obviously would rely on, on the other experts that you've hired, or if we didn't have one on staff, I'd be asking for, for somebody from outside the district to come in. Um, and then there's that last piece about consensus, and I, I'm not a big fan of one more than half, meaning this is a great idea. Um, but I think it's important that, um, that, that the staff has an opportunity to be heard, just like the student's voice, 
need to have staff voice, um, teacher voice, para voice, uh, and, and making sure that they, they feel like they're listened to. I think, I think resistance a lot of times happens is stronger when people don't feel like they were listened to at all on the, on the front end of something. And, and in that, that's when it starts to feel like you're doing something to people instead of for them. So I would hope that um, through the trust and through a process of, of, um, of sharing why we do something and showing value that uh, I'd be able to minimize the resistance. The resistance doesn't always just go away. Uh, sometimes with time, people will start to see the value. Um, and every now and again, you, you have, you're gonna have some people on your staff that um, they just don't agree. But if we can get to a point where we agree to disagree and we have mutual respect for one another, uh, I think we can still get the work done. Follow up, what other people have? No, go ahead. Um, you know, there's uh, earlier in your opening statement, you brought up the idea, and you just touched upon it again uh, about facilitating staff input. Uh, how exactly have you gone about doing that in your current district? Ah, which is great. So, we the tripod also has a staff survey. So, we use our version, the administrative kind of survey to staff. We also take the union survey, and what I've tried to do is triangulate the information so when there are common themes, um, that's where we spend a tremendous amount of focus. I would say another thing that I'm most proud of is the fact that we were able to create an executive leadership academy, and the, and the content of that executive leadership academy, or the, the way we go about business, it really is from the trenches. They're, they communicate what our administrative staff needs to have in terms of being able to support the classroom teacher, and I develop professional development for staff through that executive leadership academy. For instance, it could be around evaluation. It could be around vehicles to, um, for support of diversity or, or celebration, but a lot of that information comes directly from the teachers through those surveys. We triangulate and then we put together the Executive Leadership Academy to um, make sure that our administrative staff has the skills to support the classroom teachers. Um, one of the things that when I first started, I was all about accountability, rigor, and evaluation. And uh, my union president came to me and said, that's great, we're, not, we, we're fully on board with your, your core values for this district but you're missing a leg to the chair. It's support. And so I said, you're absolutely right. So that, that became our fourth core value in terms of support. And um, then, I, then I had to come up with ways that would be um, vehicles for people to help us figure out what kind of support is needed. So classroom teachers are very clear about the support to the administrative staff. You know, uh, you're a teacher, so you get it. Um, a lot of times it has to do with classroom discipline and how discipline is managed. It could have to do with evaluation. Are we giving real good feedback to people so they can get better at what they do? Um, you know, are evaluations valid and reliable? You know, are people making the observations? Are they doing it? Is there a system that's fair that actually helps improve teaching and learning? It's not a gutcha kind of system. It's not. It, uh, so I, I think that's important. Um, again, as I'm a systems builder, so I don't believe you can just take systems from one district. There are blueprints that are you can be successful with in different places, but I think. Things need to be tailored, kick and punch, so they fit the community that you work in. So I don't think there's a community of teachers that given the opportunity to participate or give you good information to help your administrative staff get better, uh, I don't believe there's a community that wouldn't want that. Um, it's just a matter of how that would look. But in my particular district, I triangulate the information because I, I, know, that the I know the tripod survey is a valid and reliable one because it's been, it's been tested. The, the actual union survey is one that they just created, um, but there are themes, there are themes. So I think that, that triangulating that information has made whatever we've decided to do um, solid, and, uh, and, and it, it has helped build the relationship so it's not a us and them. The administrative staff and the instructional staff feel like it's us uh, in, in many ways. And that, that's not a given, and it's something that needs to be worked on, because that can change in any given year, in any given climate, it, it, you know, for whatever reason, you know, there's politics and pedagogy. Uh, so uh, I think that's something that you have to literally keep your finger on the pulse. You have to continue to find ways to have teachers um, uh, be able to participate. Uh, for instance, I, you know, I, I met your union president earlier, and I, it was funny. I was thinking about, and I didn't share this with him, but I'm, with my union president, I'm even checking with him about snow days. You know, we have a, a concept. Um, blizzard bags, and I know we don't really have them in Massachusetts, but blizzard bags is a, an online learning day that if 80% of the students and staff participate, it counts as a school day. Well, I need the staff buy-in because one failed blizzard bag and that program is over, right? So I, I need to know that teachers feel like they were given adequate notice and that they're prepared to participate in, a, in an online blizzard bag day. Well, how do I do that? I, I have to go through my union president. So again, soliciting information a number of different ways uh, is important, even as much as when we're going to have a blizzard bag day or a snow day, um, it's important. 
So thank you. <clears throat> what, what one follow up question I have on this. So we do we do a lot of climate studies here as well, and we see them in the school improvement plans. I think it's great that students have are able to be heard and teachers be able to be heard. But I also think as the <clears throat> as the manager, it's important for you to also hear evaluation from people as well. And so is there an opportunity for people to evaluate you other or does the school committee you know I assume the school committee evaluates you but how do you use the evaluation that you get to try to work on you know how you can improve as well well I, I practice what I preach so I felt self reflect and self select yeah. you know so we have a 360 you know so we get feedback from a number of different sources um, and so you know you look at um, I, I always talk even about even about that tripod survey because I, I use I use um, challenge and compassion because they, they can be interchangeable to some degree. Because if I'm too challenging, I may not seem compassionate. Mm -hmm. And if I'm too compassionate, I might not be challenging enough. So I war, I, I'm very cautious about the fact that I don't want to make a strength a weakness or a weakness a strength at the expense of the other. Mm -hmm. So I listen, and um, you know, it's a lot of times in, uh, you, you take all that information and you try to, you know, you obviously work directly with a school committee or a school board. Um, they have goals, mm -hmm. um, you know. And, and, and it's funny because different groups want different things and sometimes those things may compete with one another. So there's a delicate balance there and I use those two like compassion and challenge. You know, we want, we want achievement and we don't care how you do it or you know, we want people to feel a certain way. And um, so I think, I think that's important, especially looking at your own work um, about being, um, you know, being firm and friendly. You know, obviously uh, you know, making sure that um, you know, you've had a steady hand on this ship and North Reading has a wonderful reputation. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, having the leader make sure that uh, everybody feels like they're involved, and, and one way is soliciting that information from everybody, and not making change in a radical kind of abrupt way that that kind of shocks the system. Now there are times when shocking the system may be an appropriate strategy, but there are times when it's not. So, um, and that, I think that comes with experience. I think, um, you know, when I was a classroom teacher, I thought I understood the assistant uh, principal's role, and I didn't until I was the assistant principal. And when I was an assistant principal, I thought I knew the principal's role, and, and that was true too. As a high school principal, you know, I thought um, I thought I knew what being a superintendent was. But now, after seven years, going into my eighth year, um, there's no substitute for experience. So I think part of that experience is really making sure you listen to everyone, and decisions you make are very calculated and strategic about how you go about improving. Making sure again that you don't make a strength a weakness while you're trying to work on something that maybe somebody else thinks is a weakness. Fair enough? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so the next topic we want to talk about is community engagement. I believe, Janine, you're going to lead this one. <clears throat> Excuse me, that would be me. <clears throat> All right, sorry my voice is off because of allergies, but anyway, increasingly debates happen on social media concerns school-related issues, concerning, sorry, school-related issues. If you heard of an issue arising on social media, how would you address it? Ah. Well, um, as a young superintendent, now I feel like I'm an older superintendent, as a young <laughs> superintendent, um, I felt like I, I jumped on this a little too quickly. You know, So every time I saw something, I would talk to my administrative assistant and I'd say, can you get so-and-so in, have so-and-so in, have so-and-so in. Um, when I felt like people were misinformed or writing things online um, that weren't true or weren't good for the district or, you know, and then at some point, um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Facebook because I think there's so much on Facebook that it just takes you down rabbit holes in a lot of ways. So I think the important thing is to be cognizant of what, what's being said, um, being able to separate out what's real from what's kind of being manufactured, um, you know, and then just encouraging people to, to kind of go through whatever systems you have in place to get their issues addressed. You know, I think we're in a, we're in a, we're in a time now where people just run right to the top. Now, um, again, guilty, you know, sometimes, you know, I may have a parent in and my high school principal may want to, uh, we may not be so happy because they haven't even spoken to the high school principal yet. So I, I think that's a feel thing. You know, how urgent is this? How important is this? You know, how is that particular person feeling? And then making sure that I communicate back to the high school principal. I want, I want you to know, I, I saw um, you know, so-and-so today about this particular issue. I encourage them to go back to see you about it. But um, I think it's situational. Um, but I also think it's important to acknowledge how people feel about particular issues. Uh, and we do that in a number of ways. I don't communicate, I do not participate on Facebook. Um, I use Twitter very much like your current superintendent does uh, to communicate things that are going on in the district, celebrate learning, snow days, uh, those sorts of things. Um, you know, so many good things going on. The hard part is, is you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you miss some things too. And then people are reminding you like, well, you tweeted out about this, this, and this, but you missed this. Um, 
So I think those sensitive issues, though, to make sure that you you um, you make those phone calls to people if you know them. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I don't I don't. I don't scrub social media on a daily basis, but um, w lots of other people do. So they, they send you emails, they communicate with you a number of different ways to let you know what's going on. Uh, so again, I think it's about having your finger on the pulse, knowing when action needs to be taken, um, who, when you should reach out, when you should not reach out, when you should have the building level people do it. I think that comes with experience. Um, if you haven't been in the role, um, you know you may do what I did when I first started. You may call everybody and have everybody in, and then you realize, You've now overscheduled yourself to the point where you, you're, you're not going to be able to get to the rest of the work that you need to get to. So you need to be smart about the way you use your time um, and, and strategic. So uh, I don't think any issue is too small. Uh, you know, for, for the parent, that may be the biggest issue. And, in, in, you know, and in, in just hearing from you may be enough. Um, it, you know, so I, again, I think it's situational. But uh, I'm a people person, so I'm always reaching out. I'm always talking to people. And I'm always trying to be, uh, I have an open door and I'm accessible to folks. So. Um, I don't think that would be any different. I, I, I do feel like it would be less challenging here than where I am, primarily because I have five towns, right? And so I have you know competing issues, and, the, and I think um, everybody rowing in the same direction, everybody supporting the district. Um, I think I think you can super serve a district um, when it's a single town. I think it gets to be very complicated when it's to be five towns. But um, you would ha it would have my my undivided attention. All I can promise you is, no one will work harder, um, and and no one will want. Uh, to be good at what they do more than, than me if, if I'm your selected candidate in that regard. So if that means going back to calling every single person every time there's an issue, um, uh, I'm certainly, uh, I have the energy to do it. Uh, I, just, I just know that that's not the best approach, but um, I, I just, I, I would need to kind of find out what North Reading wants, you know, from their superintendent, you know, and uh, I think every, every town, every community, every district's just a little bit different. Um, I think everybody enjoys access, so I think that that would be a common theme. It's just, what's that look like? Um, you know, and I'd be willing to flex my style to fit wherever I end up working, and if it's, if it's North Reading, I, I certainly, um, I'd be willing. I, I, I'm not narrow-minded in that respect. I'm pretty open-minded to know that I need to adjust my style. I had to adjust my style from the middle school I worked in to the high school. I certainly had to adjust my style when, when, when taking on a, a very large uh, two-district SAU in New Hampshire, so um, I'm open-minded when it comes to that. I think, I think if anyone has a solution to social media, I'd love to hear it. Because <laughs> I don't think there is one solution. And That's right. I mean, there, again, with anything, I think there's a good piece to, to it. You know, a lot of people hear about things that they would not have heard about another way. But then it also gives a forum. And as you mentioned, I think there's some things start and 80% of it is true and 20% is not. And some start and 20% is true and 80% is not. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think I agree. I think a lot of it is getting to the bottom of it. So, yeah. Regulation, you know, I mean, um, true story, when I'm out measuring the infield grass at the baseball field because of social media, I've gone too far, right? So <laughs> I got a ruler out there that's three inches on the third baseline. It's two and a half, you know, because they're complaining about the length of the grass. And, yeah. um, so, uh, you know, you, you, everybody wants to be good at what they do and you want to be responsive, but uh, you, you really need to be strategic about how you use your time and, and what you respond to because you'll end up chasing squirrels and you won't get done what you need to get done. And so you need to be... Um, you need to be strategic, and, and you certainly need to take it, you know, you need to use your staff appropriately. You. Um, what's your experience working with the police, the fire, and parent organizations within your multi-districts? Uh, great. Well, one of the things, another thing that I was really proud of, the fact that um, um, we had a chief of police in Plasta who, who passed away, and God rest his soul, he was, he was incredible. But... Uh, they had never had the opportunity to get all the police chiefs to the same table to get a memorandum of understanding about how we would do business with all five towns. Um, and he was instrumental in working directly with me. Um, you know, my, my brother's a chief of police. My father was a law officer. So I, I have, it's in my family uh, in that regard. So uh, I've spent a lot of time with the chief, um, and it's very much like with the union president. Um, we, personal cell phone, 24-7, uh, five of them now, you know, um, certainly with the fire chiefs as well. You know, if we have building safety issues, um, PTOs, you know, groups that support the arts. Um, you know, for me, a lot of times, you know, I, I appreciate being invited and I'll, I accept every invitation. Um, I may go as a casual observer if not invited uh, to PTO or, or any kind of support groups. Um, you know, we have a Timberlane, Timberlane Music Association, which is pretty incredible um, as far as um, the support of the arts. You know, we have different athletic boosters and those sorts of things. Um, you just make yourself available. 
and um, you know, when invited, you come and you speak or you, you support, you ask what their concerns are, how, what can I do to help? Uh, and um, you know, for me, again, I'm a people person, so that's the easy part of the job for me. Uh, so you know, I, I, I would um, envy us in a place where we're back to one district, you know, uh, back to one town with everybody rowing in the same direction. I think, I think it's something I would be even more effective and better at um, because there wouldn't be competing issues really per se as sometimes you have with two different districts and five different towns. So um, I think it's a challenge that, uh, um, again, I think my experience would make me even better in a single district now um, than I would have seven or eight years ago. Um, similar to like how you reached out to the five different police officers or district chiefs and kind of got them all to the <coughs> same table, would you have ever thought to do that with the PAs of the different five districts to have them all come and have that monthly or <coughs> semi-monthly meeting? Well, we, we do have parent groups that support, you know, the, the whole, the whole, the whole district It's it's two different districts. So it's, um, yeah, so part of that, you know, whether those place, whether that, that's in place already or whether it's something that needs to be structured and organized, you know, by the, the SAU. Um, I think what was different for, um, for the SAU in New Hampshire, typically the New Hampshire SAUs, the superintendent they would hire and they would just typically um, manage the meetings with the boards and do the budget. So what was different is I came, my experience was more of an educational leader that also provided services. So most of the superintendents in New Hampshire, so it was different for them um, right out of the box. So for me, in terms of being uh, involved in the day-to-day -day operations and being an educational leader, uh, that's what my experience was in Massachusetts, and that's what I brought, which was very different. So there was a learning curve, bless you, a learning curve for, for, um, for those districts. And so similar to what you asked, you know, what's the superintendent's role in terms of organizing parent groups, and are you just an observer? So the more leadership that I took there was something new uh, for them in terms of coming in and trying to, trying to tell them what their group should do. Um, so we do have some groups that are pulled together uh, because it happens at the middle school and the high school is a cooperative, four towns, not five, but they're two, two separate districts. So um, again, I think it's situational and I think whatever that particular district needs and wants, um, your job is to deliver, execute. So sometimes you're providing advice and you're advising and other times, you know, you're waiting for direct, you know, you're waiting to be asked or, or given a directive to help. Scott, <coughs> thank you. Yes, go ahead, Chris. Um, so you, uh, as we know, with, with SAU 55, you have two different school boards to work with simultaneously, and uh, luckily we only have the one here. But, um, but you've also mentioned that uh, for you, consensus is a very important thing, not just getting one more than, than half is how you put it. Uh, can you describe a time when it, you struggled to but ended up building consensus over something that the school boards were not agreeing on already? Well, I, I, your question, it's a good question, and I'm, I'm trying to think yeah, yeah. of, um, you know, it, there are specific, there's three different board meetings. So Timberlane meets separate, there's nine board members. Hampstead meets separate, there's five board members. They come together as an SAU of, of 14. So I guess in terms of specificity, are we talking consensus <coughs> in one of the districts or consensus in terms of the SAU? Now, the SAU, remember, it's just services that are provided to the two districts. I see. So they don't necessarily share a lot other than they try to, uh, it's for cost savings. So if we can have one bus contract, there might be a savings, right? If mm -hmm. a student is going to service both districts, they'll give you a break on the, on the contract. But I think your question is probably an easier question to answer if, if I think about something that's specific in terms of an initiative in a district that they didn't necessarily have consensus on. Yeah, I think that that would, that would suffice. Okay, so I don't even know if I really reached consensus on this. So <laughs> when, I, when I first started, this was one of those, um, you know, behind closed doors with the school board. Um, we, have a, we have a really robust performing arts center in, in Timberlane, and uh, they do a lot of performances. And they had complete autonomy, and the SAU superintendent wasn't involved, or the school board for that matter, in anything they did other than providing the funding. So this gets down to artistic freedom, right? So um, they wanted to put on this uh, play, Sweeney Todd. Are you familiar with the play? Okay, so it's a community production at Sweeney Todd. School board at the time was, well, for lack of a better term, was, was very conservative. Um, I'm brand new, and so they're talking to me about, are you gonna allow them to put on Sweeney Todd? And I was like, wasn't sure how this conversation would go, so we had a long conversation in terms of, uh, the consensus of the board was, you need to tell them that they're not putting it on. And you know, so we had a long conversation. The consensus was, okay, it's not a community performance the way it's designed. 
right? Because it's a lot of blood, a lot of, a lot of things. So, um, so not being able to change them, I, I shared that um, with the Performing Arts Center. And um, next thing you know, I was hearing from Broadway and, you know, <laughs> Meryl Streep and all kinds of people telling me, let the kids put the plant. So I was able to, the consensus I was able to get them, I said, let me talk to them about putting a more appropriate version of it on. So they, they kind of toned it down to more of a middle school kind of version. So instead of cutting throats, they, you know, they pulled scarves. They made modifications to the, the play that were appropriate. I think, um, you know, and then being able to go back to the group and they, they got to fight to keep the play, which was a good message, right? They did it in a very uh, respectful kind of professional way. They got to, you know, um, work through the superintendent's office and they were able to stand up for what they believed and they were able to get it in an appropriate kind of way. And I think the school board came around in terms of support, uh, the community came around in support. So. Um, I think for me, I, w I was pretty much the liaison in between, you know, students and their right to put on and their right to artistic freedom and, and a more conservative approach. And I think for us, that, um, that helped the community in, in terms of moving forward about everybody having kind of input when we decided what we were going to do as a, as a community. So, um, you know, they looked, they looked at the next performances moving forward and they were, I think they were sensitive to the fact that if we're going to put this on for the entire community, we need to think about the entire community. We need to think about four and five year olds that are going to be here as in addition to adults. But, um, you know, the strong arts people were, were adamant that they should be able to do whatever they want. It's your choice whether or not to come and see it. But we were really trying to build a community kind of performance. So that, that was a defining kind of moment for me um, and, and realizing um, at one point you know, I, you asked the other night about, you know, my budget, um, my philosophical budget, and I talk about bullseyes. Well, this is a different kind of bullseye, right? So a lot of times it's taking all the bullseyes off everybody else and putting it on your back um, for the greater good, for the, you know, for, for the district. Um, so, you know, everybody's pointing fingers and everybody's blaming everybody, and really, it's really the superintendent's responsibility to kind of build that kind of consensus, if you will, that we're going to get to a good place. We're going to work this out together. It's about relationships. It's about our community. Um, and, you know, while... While the, con while the controversy or contention is going on, a lot of it's going to be focused on, it can be focused on a lot of different people. It can be on the director, it can be on the students, it can be on, no, you just kind of channel that all through the superintendent's office and, and with the support of the school committee or school board, um, you have an opportunity to kind of build consensus in the community and the community gets stronger, feels like their concerns were listened to, um, both sides got an opportunity. I did a public forum, um, pretty one-sided, mostly the people that support the arts, those other people kind of, you, you take care of that. I sat there, I listened, um, and I think I came back with what I think was a really reasonable solution that kind of helped build consensus in the community. So that, that's one example. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's move on to the, I, I get this uh, fun task of budget conversation. So <laughs> first question comes, well, it comes, you're a sports guy, so it comes from a, I think it's Tyson that said everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yep. So. <laughs> For the budget, everyone has a strategic plan that they want to implement, but how do you implement a plan when you get level services funding year after year if and you have to struggle to get even to that point? So, so for me, um, <clears throat> I felt like we had, we had adequate funding. Um, and I, I explained the other night, uh, too, New Hampshire does their funding just a, just a little bit differently than, than Massachusetts. Um, but I, for me, when I first started, it was really about doing a deep dive and repurposing money. Meaning, so there were, there were some funds being spent on things that really weren't delivering on the outcomes. And I gave you an example of, of something I've just repurposed. Um, I talked about Chief 3000, a program that I felt like had delivered on everything that it could, uh, and um, we needed to look at a different way to, to work on informational text. Um, when you start in a district, sometimes everybody becomes comfortable and you're using particular uh, programs that may or may not be delivering what they were when you first started, or maybe not delivering at all. On, and, and it's just what you do. Um, we had another program that was called the YES program, was the Youth Employment um, Services. Um, it, it was, we were spending about $200,000 on about seven or eight kids. Um, it wasn't really making that kind of difference um, for those students. And so talking about repurposing money, looking at how those funds are being spent. Now you're brand new, you start. Now I started on, I started on Labor Day, the Monday after Labor Day. Um, schools already open. Um, you know, you're already into that budget year, and we budget 18 months out. Um, so I really had to, like, quick, quick learn, like, all right, we're budgeting already for the following year. We've got to make sure that we look at these programs. Um, and so I think you have to rely on your staff, because staff knows they're here. Um, you know, sometimes leadership becomes committed to a particular series of programs, but uh, 
you know, you identify your, your most important needs, what are the things you need to have, uh, and um, you look at your current budget. And I think, I think repurposing money is really the smart way to go about it instead of just adding on to the budget. Um, and uh, that, that served us well, um, you know, for several years in terms of looking at the way certain money was being spent on certain programs and then deciding, you know, making sure that goals were very clear. You got buy-in, yep, this is absolutely something we need to work on. Um, if we do it this way, if we use our resources this way, and again, thinking about equity, right? Are we, when we repurpose money, are we making sure that it, we're spending it on the kids that need it most or the programs that are needed most? Um, so I, uh, the short answer really is really more of a repurposing of what you already have as opposed to, um, and again, I, you know, I'm not making any value judgments about anything in North Reading. You know, you, it may be perfect, I don't, I don't know. Um, but there is always opportunities to find money to repurpose on new initiatives. Mm. Okay, and then, so when, when you were talking about repurposing and reevaluating, you, you gave an example of 200,000 on seven or eight kids. Is your vision more about <clears throat> how much, how many different kids can be impacted by it, or is, is it always by, you know, the more kids that can be impacted by it, or are there sometimes other decisions that you have to be made about that maybe they, these are seven or eight kids, and I'll give you an example here where we've really tried to put an emphasis on keeping kids in district whenever we can. You know, we've hired coordinators to try to identify needs early so that, you know, we, we believe that, that it's an investment in the future where we can keep students in the district and not have to have them go out of district when they get to middle school or high school. There's a long-term savings from that. And so I, I guess I'd just push back a little bit and say, is it always on the number of kids that are impacted or are there other, other concerns you have? Well, philosophically for me, really, it's, it's to do the greatest good for the greatest number, yeah. right? So um, if, if, if that's where the burning decision needs to be made, I'm always going to side with I'm going to do the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, that's not to say that I won't give great personal attention to those that need it. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if we're doing a good job with the budget and we're doing a good job with staff, and I, I, I wholeheartedly agree about, uh, I'm not a fan of sending people out. It's almost, um, unless you have to, it's almost an admission of failure. Like I do believe that a public district run the right way with the right people can service all kids, right? I also have to be sensitive to, you know, the programs that you have in place to service all kids to make sure that we're not disrupting the learning of others, right? So it's not just, we don't just wish things into place and say they're great when, when, when maybe they're not. So it's really having um, a system that evaluates to make sure that we're doing the greatest good for the greatest number and we're making really smart decisions about um, when we don't feel like we can service somebody, that may be an expense we may have to incur. But uh, I, I do agree with the fact of trying to keep everything um, in-house and, and to do a good job, create your own programs. <coughs> Um, again, that gets that modifications. If, you, if you're really good at modifications, modifications are good for all kids, not just gifted students or students with disabilities, so. Okay. I think my last question on this is just, so when you start to create the budget, do you start with what your thoughts are? You start it from the top and then try to build it from there? Do you try to start from the bottom and see what people want, what people need, and then start from the bottom up? Well, for me, you know, I, I know in this term gets thrown out a lot, zero-based budgeting. So mm -hmm. it's basically about what you need. So working with teachers, I mean, working with um, building level administrators, working with program um, coordinators, those sorts of things, um, making sure that they can justify exactly what they're asking for from zero on up every year. So we don't just take the previous year's number and add two or three percent to it and say like, well, we needed, you needed 238,000 last year, you're gonna need 254,000 dollars the next year. It's really about justification. Um, a lot of times, though, they'll need a direction. So for me, if, if, it's, if we're level funded, I'd be like, you're level funded. So that, that means you're level funded unless somehow we can justify. So again, if I have to take from somewhere else because you really could justify you needed more than the level funding in that particular issue <coughs> area, because it's a bottom line budget to some degree, right? So you're, you're just trying to make sure you can fit everything that you need uh, in, in that, that magic number. But um, to start zero based and kind of work, work your way up. Um, I think the other way, it's almost impossible because there are mandatory increases and things that you have no control over, you know, health care and things. So I think you, you, have to, you have to watch those numbers very carefully. Otherwise, it becomes a 7 or 8% increase before you know it, and you haven't even really added anything to it. Okay. We just, I know we're running a little tight, but um, just talking about the, uh, uh, the sort of the funding side, have you, can you talk about what opportunities you've been able to take advantage of to seek outside funding or, or, or funding that you actually have to go after 
uh, other than through the towns um, uh, to, to support initiatives. Great. I feel, I feel like a lot of times when I'm answering these questions, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing things from Quincy because that's where, I, that's where a great deal of my training, you know, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I first arrived in New Hampshire, they didn't have business partners at all. Um, it's, not a, it's not a model really in New Hampshire. Um, property tax pays the entire school bill going back to businesses and asking them to contribute. Uh, we were able to put together a, a, a robust business partnership um, with places like the YMCA and other places that, that contribute to our district in a positive way. Sometimes it's the sharing of facilities. Sometimes um, it's the sharing of personnel. Sometimes it's inviting people in. Um, but on top of that, a lot of times it's, it's cash contributions. So part of my school board meetings, um, and every school board's a little bit different, right? So um, I got two, three things that I was able to get the school board, school committee to agree. One is um, we need to get to the different towns and different schools. So we, we move from school to school. Uh, for our school meeting, school board meetings, school committee meetings. Um, they had hoped that we were going to get scores of people to attend. That didn't happen. Broadcasts weren't as great. Live stream was difficult. Um, so, so we kind of stopped that. But part of it was, I was like, we need to start with why we do what we do. And so part of it is we're going to invite in students and we're going to celebrate students at the beginning of our meetings. So that, that was part of it. And the other part was, we're going to celebrate, this gets to the spirit of your question, we're going to celebrate those people that are donating things to our district. So you're going to accept donations. I know I can accept them up to a certain amount, and then you can accept them up to a certain amount, and then we have to have public hearings. But we're going to make that almost a ritual that all of our meetings, so whether somebody gave $200 to us or $2,000 or, or $20,000, we're going to recognize them, thank them, and celebrate. That increased you know, the donations. Um, Tenfold. I mean, more people as they started to get recognition. And that's not the reason they were donating the money, was the recognition. But when people realized, oh, I can donate money, you know, so people started saying, you know, it's $300 for a scholarship or it's $500 for a Lego set to go to, you know, to work on uh, Lego robotics or whatever it may be. Um, we just, we, that just increased the number of people that were, were donating or contributing to the district. So as part of that business partnership, in addition to celebrating student learning, in addition to celebrating the donors, I think our, our district has benefited um, quite a bit. <clears throat> okay, so I want to move on to the last topic. So leadership and vision, Diana. So our first question is um, just around school culture. So in your opinion, how does the superintendent impact school culture? I think the superintendent impacts school culture in a number of ways. One, one is visibility. So, um, you know, being around, communicating with your staff directly, and that's all staff, custodians, cafeteria workers, principals, teachers, whatever. I, I think that that's important. I think when you have strategic kind of vehicles for people to participate in the decision-making process, I think that has a tremendous impact on culture and climate. Um, I think, again, it, it really comes down to relationships. So do you have personal connections with people? Or are you the guy behind the curtain? And so I think visibility, relationships, all those sorts of things, um, I think will, will have a great impact on school culture. I think also, though, you know, as I get back to those surveys, whether it's a union survey or a tripod survey, whatever, I think in our business, a lot of times people hear people say a lot of things, but they want to see action. So being able to communicate a theory of action based on the, on the feedback that you get from the people that you work with, I think that's really important in terms of culture. Because if I come to you over and over and over again with the same problem and you get lip service because you're good at talking to people but you don't actually have a theory of action to back it up, I think that erodes at culture in a way that is very hard to recover from. So I don't waste people's time. I don't want people wasting my time. So if I tell somebody I'm going to do something, you can take it to the bank, I'm going to do it. And I would, if I'm not going to do something, I would also tell them that, you know, thank you for your concern, but we're not going to do that because it will have these impacts on these other things areas that I don't believe is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. But I think being honest with people um, also helps build that trust. And I think that trust kind of gets itself down to the trenches. Um, I think if teachers feel like administrators are being held accountable, and if administrators feel like teachers are being held accountable, and, and people feel like students are being held accountable, and the superintendent's being held accountable, and everyone's being held accountable, so it gets back to accountability, evaluation, rigor, and support, I think that that support really is something that um, is the final piece to really improving a school culture in a way that people feel respected, cared for, um, you know, and I, I think you can only, you, you demonstrate that in a number of different ways, you know. Do you make sure that everybody's physical and mental well-being is cared for? Everybody in the district, students, all staff, you know, not just, not just your health benefits, but um, 
you know, does, is, does your human resource department, um, does your superintendent and everybody else on, on down um, make sure that they care for staff? I think that that matters. And, and in districts like that, you don't have people holding up contracts saying, I don't have to do this because this is what this says. You have people saying, what else, what else can I do to help? And I think, um, you know, practice what you preach. And um, I think the culture will increase and improve in a, in a way that, um, you know, people will feel respected and cared for, and that's the most important part. We're in the people business. Um, we don't want to lose sight of that. Thank you. And speaking of people and staff, are there specific traits that you look for in your administrative team? There are. You know, one, um, one piece is loyal. So are you loyal to the district? Are you loyal to the, the mission and the vision? Um, I look for people that are really smart. You know, I, I would say there's no secret to my success, any success I may or may not have had. I surround myself with people smarter than me. Um, I don't pretend to know everything. I don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. I, um, I hire people uh, that, that I feel are experts at what they do, and then I rely on them. I trust them. I, um, I expect that they'll trust me. So that's important. Um, so again, loyalty It's people that are really smart. People that, um, that really care about people, you know, that, that are really good with people are, are important to have on staff. Um, you need all kinds, so it takes, I think one of the things I learned very quickly when I went from a classroom teacher to assistant principal, and I, didn't, I thought I knew what the assistant principal would do, the first thing I learned is I, I learned very quickly that it takes all kinds of people to reach children. And I thought I had a really successful strategy or, or skill set in terms of how I did, I ran my classroom, but you start to realize to reach all kids, it takes a lot of different, a lot of different, um, so I look for diversity uh, in terms of the staff, you know. Um, it's not everybody else's job to make up for my weaknesses. However, I need to be strategic. I need, to, I need to be really honest with myself about what I do well and what I don't do well and make sure that I surround myself with people uh, that can take care of that work um, so that everything gets done. I don't believe there's a person that does everything perfectly. Uh, I don't believe there's a superintendent around that can do all things. Um, so it's important to be very strategic about the people you pick. I don't pick people that are identical to me. I, I try to find a really diverse staff that can reach all people. And I think that gets back to climate and culture. Um, you know, I, I practice what I preach, family first. You know, I, I, I want people to, to feel like their physical and, and mental well-being is cared for by the district, right from the superintendent's office on down. Um, and, and in turn, uh, I think that helps build on those, those characteristics that I talked about in terms of loyalty, trust, smart, care for people. Um, I think that that's important. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I've been, I've been, I've just been blessed with the people that I've, I've been surrounded, whether I inherited them or whether I selected them, uh, I've been blessed. So, you know, I had this debate with somebody many, many years ago when we were both principals and he said, I need to find people to groom. And, uh, and, and my theory was, if you pick the right people, they'll groom you. And so, so I, I feel like I've been groomed by some really, really, really good people. Uh, and and uh, I feel blessed for it. What, sorry, go ahead. what? What is your administrative team right now? I mean, who, what are the positions that you have right now that you work with? That I work with directly? Yes, currently. Yeah, I so I, I have a superintendent's leadership team. So we, we, Timberlane is pretty, is pretty well staffed in terms of that. So my superintendent's leadership team is <coughs> SLT. I have a director of data accountability and um, uh, evaluation. I have a director of curriculum. Um, as I'm going around, I have a, a, a director of transportation. Um, you know, then we have a director of pupil personnel services. We also have a director of student services, special ed, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, have a human resource director, an assistant superintendent, chief financial officer, a business operations coordinator, typically like a facilities person. Um, that, that's the superintendent's leadership team and a technology director. So that's the superintendent. On the Hampstead side, I call it the assistant superintendent's leadership team because I use the assistant superintendent to do something very similar with that instructional, that staff of, of leadership. Then you have your traditional principals, assistant principals, deans um, that are like almost like department heads. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a big administrative staff in terms of um, trying to provide that support. Really, in the, the theory was really around providing support. So it wasn't being about top heavy. It was, it was about making sure that our core values are being addressed. Questions? Could I ask a closing of question? Yes, any in questions? In your opening statement, you said that you know, you, if you were to come back from, to Massachusetts, you wanted to come back for the right school district. What does the right school district look like to you? Uh, the right school district is a school district that um, supports public education. I think the right school district is a, is a school district that um, has, 
has had a steady hand. Um, you know, it's not in terms of, um, for me, and I look at it from both personally and professionally. So um, we would look to relocate. So I'm looking for a place that I'd want to continue to raise my children. I have a daughter that's going into her senior year. I've uprooted her once, so I want to let her finish her senior year. Um, but years go by fast, you know, and I have a daughter that's in seventh grade going into eighth grade. So, you know, I've looked at districts where we felt like um, it's a community that, uh, that so your core values, when I talk about, you know, community service as something that's important in North Reading. So I was like, well, that's, that's great. Lifelong learners, um, people that appreciate and respect public education. Um, this community appears to be a community, and I, I've, I knew this when I was at North Quincy, so this is, uh, is a community that, that supports athletics and the arts and academics, um, has been very successful. Um, I look for places that I think that I could add value, right? So that, that going from a middle school principal to a high school principal, when I said, you know, one of my biggest challenges was making change in a place that already works. So when I went to North Quincy High School, um, you know, being able to make change, add value to a place that's already good at what they do, uh, I believe that's North Reading. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been very selective in terms of looking, but those, those are really kind of the, the variables that I was looking at, um, you know, because I, I do believe I'm in the prime of my career. I do believe with the experience um, that I have, that I, I, I think that I can, the next district that I go to, and hopefully it's North Reading, uh, that I'll be able to add value in, in a far more seasoned superintendent than I, would have, than I was seven years ago with no experience. Um, so I think, I think I'm in the prime of my career. Like I said, I think I've been preparing my entire career, my entire life or career for, for this opportunity. Um, and, and if this is the opportunity, uh, I think um, I think it'll be great. So I, again, I look at it personally and professionally. So um, a lot of times people were like, "Why did you leave New Hampshire?" And that was really more personal. It was professional and personal, but it was I wanted to get my daughters out of the city and raise them somewhere where they feel safe and supported. Not that the city wasn't safe and supporting, but I just, um, that was more personal, and there was a job there. I think uh, we're at a point now where I think um, making a selection in terms of where's the best place to move the family to and become part of a community, um, you know, I, I've done my research. I mean, North Reading is a great place. I mean, I'd be lucky to live and work here if I, if I can. Um, so that's really, those are, that's a criteria I really use to try to look at where I think might be a good fit. And, um, you know, this is, uh, this is certainly very appealing. Um, it's a great district. It's always been a great district. I've always had steady hands on, on the direction, um, a very supportive school board, uh, school committee, if you will. So um, that's what makes it appealing. Thank you. My, my final question is, so you, you have a lot of energy, obviously, which is a good thing. And you've taken over a district or two districts that you know, needed, a, needed a lot to move forward. Isn't there a risk that you're going to be bored coming coming here? I mean, uh, being perfectly honest, I mean, you, you control a lot of people. It's a smaller district. It's, I mean, we've, we're have we doing fairly well right now. I mean, is there any chance that you'll be bored with this sort of position? Well, I, th I think it's a fair question, but I think being intellectually stimulated is my responsibility. I don't blame anybody else if I'm not intellectually stimulated. So I think you find the work within the work, and the work is different, you know? So. I see this very much like when I moved to North Quincy, and it's a place that already works. They're doing great stuff, you know. So, the real work is how do you find, how do you add value? How do you convince people that are really good at what they do already that this is going to make things a little bit better? So that that's a challenge that that's not that's not boring. I think being a champion for a place that that's doing really well. Um, you know, I've had an opportunity to rebuild a district. I've had an opportunity to to take over another district that was you know that was always a high achieving district and and add value. Um, I haven't found myself bored in either district, and I can bury myself in either district at any given time for periods of time. Um, so it, it's not a fear. Uh, it's certainly something that's a consideration when you're looking at where you'd want to work. I, I just felt like, um, I don't know, this, this, is, um, this is one of the leading districts in the, in the state of Massachusetts, in the Commonwealth, um, and there are several. So um, I think it's a very prestigious job. I, I think it would be, uh, I, I wouldn't have to move right away because you're only 20 something miles away. I can, I can spend 16 hours a day here and not not have to worry about driving two hours both ways, which is appealing. Um, so I, I, I'm, it doesn't concern me because I, I do believe the work is within the work, and I think um, it's just different work. And so, um, you know, you, you, it's gonna t it, takes you good two, it takes you a couple good three years to really get to know everybody, no matter how big or small the district is. Even a high school principal, I mean, I, I spent the whole summer that first summer going through the yearbook trying to memorize all the names and pictures so that when I met people, I knew who they were and what they did. Um, so. Um, is it compulsive? I hope not, um, but uh, it, I, I think it's important because it's the people business. So people know that you know them and they know that you care. 
uh, I think that that's really the work. So I, I see that as the good part of two or three years, just to really become, to be adopted, to be, to, for a community to really take you on as, as one of them. You, you have to spend a lot of time, and it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't think the size matters. I think, I think it's about what you spend your time on. And um, I, know, I know that, that the next move, uh, that's what you have to do. So you have to, you have to earn the confidence. You have to earn uh, the respect. You can't just demand it, no matter what your title is, right? So, uh, and if you want people to spend time and work hard, you need to demonstrate that. So I think, I think that's really the work. And so um, I don't mean to go on and on about it, but I, 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 don't, I don't feel, that's not concerning to me. Being bored in this, in this particular position is not a concern of mine. Um, I, I, I believe there's going to be enough challenge um, you know, to be adopted and embraced by the community, and you have to earn that. And that's, you do that with a lot of time. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> Thank, you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. This. All right, good luck with the rest of the night. And I, okay. and I, I just wanted to thank you again for the opportunity. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's really it's exciting to be included, in, and I appreciate being part of the process. And uh, I understand how difficult it is to find the right fit. I can only, only guarantee I can give you is no one's going to work harder, and no one's going to want it more if, if I'm your choice. So um, again, thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Yep. A new motion to go into recess. Yeah, I move that we go into recess. Recess. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Motion opposed. Case. Unanimous. Perfect. I move that we move back into open session. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So, Dr. Kuska, thank you so much for coming here today. Welcome to North Reading. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Okay. So, well, first and foremost, I do want to thank you for traveling here. I know that it's uh, not an easy commute to get up here uh, on a weekday, and we appreciate you considering the position. We know that I think everybody in this room appreciates how tough the superintendent job is to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so anybody that is uh, willing to do the job, I think it's uh, very much appreciated. And so, you know, thank you again for applying. Well, thank you for considering me. Okay. And so <clears throat> just as a quick overview of what we're going to do today. So we, I think uh, Mrs. Imbriano had sent a um, comment about for the opening statement. We want you to touch, you know, briefly upon your vision for North Reading, specifically in the next five-year strategic plan. And then after that, we're going to have a series of questions that we've tried to group them into five different topics which relate to the you know, crucial responsibilities of a superintendent. Each of us is going to lead one of those discussions and you know, we'll have a couple of opening questions and then you know, some back and forth. We really hope this is you know, interactive. We can okay. have a conversation rather than just peppering you with you know, silly interview questions the whole time. Look, sounds good. Okay, so we'll probably have about eight to ten minutes. I will have my, <clears throat> my phone out just so I can keep an idea of, of time here. Um, and so if we can begin, you know, I'd like to give you time for a brief opening statement. And during that time, if you could please address the, you know, what your vision for North Reading would be, specifically commenting on topics that you would seek to address in the next five-year strategic plan. Sure. And while I speak to that a little bit, I did yes. draft um, a vision statement. That's great. Just a draft, because if I were going to be planning, doing strategic planning <coughs> with the team, it would be a community um, event where we would work together with leadership and staff and community members and as well as school community members. But I thought just looking at the work that you've done already, it might be a good starting place for me to be thinking about. Thank you. So I'll just start by telling a little bit about my, <coughs> my path to get here today. Um, I know you have my resume and cover letter, but um, 25 years, I, I'm a lifelong learner and I've been a teacher. Um, I still think of myself as an educator because I feel like I'm educating and supporting and mentoring staff and principals and administrators now, so the role is different. I do sometimes miss teaching in the classroom. Uh, I was telling some people earlier that my husband sometimes says to me on, when I come home from a challenging day, he said, why don't you go back to being, teaching, being a teacher? You loved that. And I said, I did love that, but you know, I still think I'm teaching in a different way. But um, as you mentioned, um, it can be challenging to be in these leadership roles, but some of us get that um, thirst and the passion to, to make a difference, and that's where my lens is from. Uh, I feel like that's my primary role, is how do I continue to make a difference in my leadership role for children first, and then support staff and families and administration as well. So with that in mind, you know, I have, um, I mentioned with 25 years, I started as a special educator at the middle school level. I was an elementary educator. I've done curriculum um, in professional development planning for pre-K through 12. Uh, loved that work. I'm an educational leader, but now my lens is really in the personnel um, 
lens, and that changed, but also helped to make me incredibly well-rounded. I meet many assistant superintendents and superintendents that have not had to manage a lot of the things that I've managed in my day-to-day -day life as an assistant superintendent. I handle um, any of the legal matters in the district, civil rights, anything to do with ADA, any investigations that are brought forth to my attention. I do all the joint labor management for the district, collective bargaining. Uh, you name it, I kind of am the lawyer for the district without that title, and I obviously as need to work with legal counsel, but I try to support our administrators in so many different ways, and I am the go-to person to support them in that respect. But a lot of the work that I really like to do is um, supporting our administrators and helping to grow their capacity. Um, I tend to evaluate all of our newer administrators. I've also been in charge of supporting our way care program director. I've supported our, our director of technology, um, overseeing facilities with our facilities director. I helped develop the capital plan with him and present that. Um, so I've won a lot of different lenses and a lot of different hats, and um, it's certainly made me more than ready to be a superintendent, and that's where I really want to be at this point in my life, and North Reading seems like a great opportunity. But with that, I'll just start by reading off my draft uh, vision statement that I put together after looking at some of the work that's been done here. And I put North Reading schools develop students who are well-rounded academically, socio-emotionally, socio and civic-mindedly, and able to unlock their full potentials in order to compete successfully in an ever-changing, culturally diverse world. Because when I think about the work, I've done um, strategic planning in my previous districts as well as been on the Accelerated Improvement Plan in my current district, and the, a five-year planning is really important. Starting the process is always with looking at developing a strong vision statement. Where do we want our students to go when they leave high school? How, what kind of citizens are we trying to develop? and then looking to plan the mission statement, and that's more uh, about what we're doing today to get them towards the vision. And then you start to tie in your initiatives around so many different areas, and I did look at yours. Um, I didn't read every single item, but I certainly went through a lot of the different parts. And for me, some of the things that jumped out that I would think would like to focus on, where does North Reading as a district, as a community, want to be in five years? And then we need to go and plan backwards to get there. And the part that's nice about strategic planning when you have a long-term plan like that is that regardless of if administrators leave or staff leave the district, the plan needs to be sustainable over time so that the players can change, but people can come in and keep that vision and mission going as well. And um, with that, I would definitely want to include, you know, I, I saw some work on safety in the, in the district, and I know that you've done ALICE training. I too have been the safety and security facilitator for the district and done a lot of work about enhancing our security entrances, ensuring that all of our staff are trained on what I've trained the staff just because of the time, um, the, the availability we had. We do 4Ls training, which is locate, lockdown, leave, live. I've also, um, I am a certified trainer for Ellis as well, which I know that you've done in this district. So certainly the physical safety of our schools in this day and age throughout the Commonwealth, throughout the nation is, is critically important and I see you've done a lot of work in that area. But the next piece of that is the social emotional well-being and safety of our students. And I would think we need to do a little bit more work embedding that into the five-year plan. How do we ensure that it's embedded in all the work you do curriculum-wise? It's embedded in when they greet the secretaries at the building, when they enter the vans or they enter the buses to um, be supported by the staff that drive them back and forth to school, the paraprofessionals all of our office staff, custodial staff, food services, as well as our paraprofessionals and teaching staff, that we all work on that together as school-wide and district-wide expectations. It would be some non-negotiables. And I'm sure you're doing work in that area. I just would like to see it embedded a little bit more in the five-year plan and how we really would do that. And then the other, another area, which again, I know that your district is working on, but family and student engagement, I think is really important. Um, uh, I talked about this in my interview last week that uh, one of the hats I also wear, which is not um, necessarily part of the job, but it's something that all administrators need to be part of. I have overseen the family and community engagement team for the last five or six years in the district. And for me, it's about equity. How do we ensure that there's social justice and equity for all students so that even though you have three primaries that are feeding into one middle school and then into one high school, what are the things that we want to see common to all buildings so that students have, they're not going to have the exact experiences, but there should be some non-negotiable, equitable experiences that kids are coming into the same um, programs, that they've got some basic expectations that we all have for them. And I feel like that's important with the family engagement aspect as well, that we make sure we have enrichment opportunities that are similar at all buildings. And then, of course, each building is going to have their own flavor and individual, individuality as well. I think 
I'm not the type of administrator that wants to see everything identical because that's not, that's not realistic. But you do want to make sure that students have similar experiences and that they're getting some opportunities at, at all three buildings as they feed into the um, middle school level. And of course, curriculum and professional development is important to embed in that as well. And I think a little bit more about, you know, you've got this wonderful building and I wasn't able to view your capital plan, but how are you going to sustain this beautiful building and sustain the programs that you need to continue to, to um, facilitate the work that would um, continue into the future with a five-year plan? So there's a lot of work that can be done in um, you know, multiple areas, and uh, I do find strategic planning interesting. Um, when I've done it in previous roles, we've really kind of buckled down over the summertime and taken sometimes two or three days to work as a a larger team and, and make sure we have enough um, community representation so that we can plan together because I think the other part that's really important when you're planning is that you have all of the key stakeholders on the town side are working with you so that when the budget, if the budget gets tense and tight and we've all agreed that this is what we're working on together as a community, then there isn't that us and them tugging mentality that we've all agreed that this is where we're trying to go and we're all going to support each other to get there. So. I, I like to have that community representation. And the other um, piece that I wanted, I, I'll, I know I'll probably get to it later, so I'll just briefly touch upon, is with that five-year planning process, I think it's really critical, and this gets back to sustainability again, that you line up all of your plans for five years. I did look at online what school improvement plans were available. Some of them were not the current ones. I saw the high school has one that's going into next year as well. But I like to see when you start your strategic plan and look at where you want to go, then you take your, your five school improvement plans and line them up for five years as well. So how can we align those plans for five years and carry over that work? So again, if an administrator leaves, it's sustainable over time. And then that helps you as a school committee when we plan the budget together. Then you know what we're going to be looking for aligned up with that five-year plan. And what each building is saying, this is what they need over five years of school improvement now equates to our priorities in year one, two, three, four, and five. And then I like to do the same with technology and our capital planning. So I think the more you can continue that cycle and line things up, it, initially it's a lot of work to get them lined up, but once you get them lined up, it's just a lot more sustainable as far as um, there are expectations uh, from the whole community, from the, the staff, um, and then the final piece that I would line up for that plan is our professional development. I think at the district level, you always, when you're looking at your strategic plan, you, there are certainly things that we know that all buildings will need, and those become the district non-negotiables. And then the school improvement plans will have their expectations for the five-year plan. And then each year, you probably want to add in some PD that you weren't prepared for. But if you're trying to build capacity in certain areas, and you plan and align the professional development, there, again, there's, there's no, um, no hidden agendas. Everything's transparent, and we're all on board together, and I, and I just think staff usually are happier as well because as long as we're getting their input into some of these initiatives, um, then the buy-in is there from day one and you're not looking each year to start over with the plan again. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. So why don't we start off with the <laughs> topic of student learning and Rich is going to lead us in this discussion. Uh, so can you talk about how you vision a district really supporting um, all learners in a class, this is similar to the questions we asked last time, but um, support all learners in a classroom without penalizing any of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm speaking of, uh, you know, uh, learners, uh, you know, at all ends of the spectrum, so. Mm -hmm. Well, having been a special educator first, um, I feel, you know, I say this when I, I, I'm the one that interviews all of our new teacher hires and new paraprofessionals and administrators for the second time after they're vetted by the administrators and building level. And one of the things I always get excited about is when I see that dual certification. So it's great to have that math content, but when you have that special education training, you're already looking at the individual student, and that's what we need to focus on in the classroom. But it's very challenging when you have a variety of levels within the, the setting, and we all have, have experienced that. So I've, I've found that when you start at the elementary level, we, um, you know, I've used with teachers, I've done a lot of work training them on RTI, response to intervention, and now MTSS, which is Mass Tiered System of Supports, which is to me the same, um, same thing. And making sure that there's a core curriculum that everybody is exposed to in Tier 1, but then you do have to then find out what the needs of our Tier 2 population and our Tier 3 population. And I do feel elementary teachers, having had that training as well as the middle school training, I find that 
elementary teachers tend to have had a lot more training when they're coming out of school, and high school teachers have not had that specific training necessarily, and even sometimes our upper middle school teachers, they're very content specific. When you can give them some of that MTSS training as well and show them how to embed that in their daily work, and you know, back in the day when I was teaching, it was differentiated instruction. It's all differentiated because we have to differentiate because we have multitude of learners and multitude of levels. And then we also have to make sure we're um, hitting our ELL population and our special needs population within that same core instruction. <coughs> so I, I know um, just from my 15 years as a teacher, it's a lot of work to do it well. And it isn't a job that you can clock in and clock out. And I have seen, you know, working with 525 teachers in my current district, there are some teachers that clock in and clock out. So it's going to be very hard if you, if you have that mentality to really try to hit all those target levels for all those students. It, it becomes um, a, a, a juggling um, daily, but I also you know that um, we shouldn't be having the exact same expectations for students as we go through from class to class. But as I mentioned with, um, with the, all five buildings, there should be some similar expectations that we have from class to class. And then teachers should be able to put their own personality into how they teach as well. So I do definitely support um, a tiered system of supports within the classroom setting, but I definitely feel that um, uh, although we've done a ton of training with our staff with that, I find it still very challenging to implement that on a daily basis. And I think using some of your curriculum support staff and trying to have them model lessons in classes may be helpful. I also love to see professional learning communities take place so that when we're um, going in to look at other classrooms, mm. uh, we'll, we come back and talk together about what we see. And I think having teachers visit, you know, particularly with the three elementary schools, getting teachers to go to different schools and see what's happening when you have exemplary teachers on your evaluation tool. Can we send um, a, a, an exemplary math teacher, have some of our developing educators go into that classroom and observe what they're doing in there? I, I really feel that as much as administrators can help support the growth of their educators, I really feel our educators learn the best from their peers, and the more we can get them learning from one another and talking and having those conversations about what's going well and what they're struggling with, I also think we need to make sure that we encourage new teachers to feel comfortable to, to talk about when they're struggling and not be afraid to do that. Um, and I was telling, I think, Janine earlier, my daughter just got a teaching job this year, and that's lesson one for her is what I've been telling her that first 90 days ask questions don't be afraid don't be in a silo afraid to ask for help because if you don't ask for help and it's not working out you're not doing what's best for students and you're not doing what's best for yourself so i strongly encourage all our new hires please ask those questions and during that whole induction process in the summer when they come in make sure you you get the support you need because you shouldn't be in a classroom feeling overwhelmed and fearful when there are supports in place throughout the high school throughout the middle school and throughout the district that you can rely on and reach out to Thanks. Um, I had was mentally making note of follow-up <coughs> questions, and then you took them off. So good. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about standardized testing. Um, you know, we often hear about how it can be disruptive. Uh, uh, the, you know, a, a negative consequence of it can be that it could be disrupt disrupt classroom learning. Um, uh, what? How do you uh, try to minimize uh, those negative impacts on student learning from that disruption? And also, what are some hidden benefits from standardized testing maybe that people don't understand, you know, that may not see it at a 10,000 foot level that you see at the district, district level? Sure, and I think back, was it 1999 when we were doing the um, at first MCAS somewhere about there? I can't remember now. Um, I remember teachers, some of them saying, oh, it's going away, it's going away. This is, this is not sustainable, it's going away. Well, it's not going away <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, because whether we like it or not, our federal funds and our state funds, we are relying on these funds to um, keep our schools going. So it's not realistic to ask it to go away because um, it's just not going to happen. So for me, it's what's that sweet spot? How can we make it so that we're not, as you said, disrupting our student learning to the point that it's taking the place of the instruction in the classroom? And I think embedding some of the, I mean, Realistically, if you're teaching the standards of the curriculum and you've, had it, you've mapped it out and you've timed it out to teach it all and get it all in, then in a, in a perfect world, they're covering as they're going. And it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do a dog and pony show right before the test um, to take more time out of learning. I do think it's important to make sure that those testing strategies are embedded into all the testing that they do and all the work that they do on a daily basis. So again, it's not taking more time out of the classroom instruction. A lot of the work I've done as a curriculum leader 
uh, you know, again, things, the, the vocabulary changes when they were talking about we were going to have district determined measures and uh, so we started with our common assessments and, you know, uh, the state's always changing the lingo but to some extent there are still pieces and threads of all the things that they said they were going to do during the race to the top. So none of it's going away, it's going to, it keeps changing and evolving and flowing and for me it gets back to really making sure that our experts in the classroom are using the content knowledge to make sure that they're developing effective um, standard, or not, stand, not, excuse me, common assessments in their own classrooms and in their own um, departments so that when it comes to the real standardized tests, the students are used to kind of the, the framework of those. And the bigger part I think um, that I struggle with as a leader is how are we making sure our students are prepared for the real world beyond? Do we go out and look five years out, 10 years out? So it's, it's great, we can look at, I can look at DESE and see you know, how many of your students are graduating from high school and going to two year colleges, four year colleges, military, all of those things. But are they becoming citizens that are civic minded and very prepared for the world at large? And how are they doing five years after they leave North Reading High? How are they doing 10 years out? Are they actually working in their fields? Because sometimes they are so, they've strayed so far off. And then the other piece to that puzzle is we don't even know what careers we're preparing our students for at this point. So this might sound terrible, but I don't even know how to word this without sounding like it's, it's the wrong way, but sometimes I think we need to blow up what we're doing in public education <laughs> and make it really the real world application. We talk about real world application and what does that look like in the classroom on a daily basis? Um, it looks so different from classroom to classroom. One of the things I do like about um, the high school I'm working in is it is a comprehensive high school and it has 12 different um, programs for career tech education. When I go to visit those classrooms, that is a real world application. It's embedded in the work they do. They do their content skills and then they are applying the skills in the culinary or cosmetology or the workshop, whatever it is. And I see that some of your students are going to programs like that outside of North Reading. But are there offerings for enrichment that can be offered more collectively within the middle school and high school environments and even pre-K all the way up so that students have some experiences that are bigger and greater than the content that we're trying to get into them? Because we're, in some cases, not really preparing our, our students for the world beyond high school. And I hear that from higher ed quite a bit when I go to meetings at um, Bridgewater State with some of the colleagues I work with. Students are not coming necessarily prepared and they get into college and they might be able to handle the academics but they can't always handle the social emotional pieces, they can't handle um, the resiliency that they need to. Um, so there's so many components to that. So um, I think there are a lot of great things happening in the <coughs> Commonwealth and also looking at your scores here, looking at your schools. There are a lot of great things happening here but if we're truly trying to get our students ready for the global world at large, I do think some changes happen, have to happen, not just at North Reading. I think it's much bigger than um, your town. It's bigger than me. Um, but I think as a commonwealth, we need to do something different because even though our scores as a state are much better than the country, at the same token, we still want it. We're competing with the world outside as well. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I have one question for you based on something you said in your uh, opening statement that pertains to student learning. You would said that uh, a priority of yours was ensuring, um, particularly in this town, we have three elementary schools and to use your words, uh, equitable experiences across all three schools. Um, what kinds of things do you think you'd bring in specifically to, th that would be equitable experiences as examples? Yeah, and I did mention family engagement, so I'll start with that. I, um, for me it was about, and again, my socioeconomics in the current town I'm working are, are different than yours, so I can, I'm only going to speak to my lens right now, but just applying that when I came here would be very important as well. So what I've seen is, because I have eight primary schools feeding into a five, six middle school, um, for example, one of the principals would call me up. Her school has a lot of struggles um, with, their, it, it's our one full Title I school that gets a lot of extra support. They, they're the only elementary school that has an assistant principal because of that. They have two reading coaches, our other buildings don't. So they have so many more supports, but their population is also more significantly needy with socioeconomics, and they're the most, most culturally diverse as well. And because of the dynamics there, they don't have a parent council that can support them in the way that some of our other schools. So if you go across town, 
these other students are getting enrichment opportunities that they can't even compete with, and it's just not fair. <laughs> so when I looked, you know, I look at that, and the, and the principal called me up and said, can you help me at the district level find funds for my students and our students so that they can have some of those experiences because they're missing out and it's just not right. And that's how we started this district-wide family and community engagement um, experience because what I wanted to do was create some common experiences pre-K through eight. Our high school students actually come and volunteer at all of our events. But I started working on year-round events and things that all of our students pre-K to eight could come to collectively so that they have those common experiences. And one of them just took place um, a couple of weeks ago. We did our end of the year culminating full steam ahead um, family engagement event and I had probably 350 to 400 family members come to it. Tons of hands-on activities, everything was free, which is huge for me to make sure that everything is free for students. And then I was able to get, we have a planetarium at the high school, so um, I helped support our, the person who runs the planetarium and I asked him, will you do a nighttime free planetarium event for these students? And we gave out tickets so that 68 eight people could see that as well. So that's the equity I'm talking mm -hmm. about with family engagement and enrichment opportunities. But it also should be equitable as far as their academic um, offerings as well. And I, I did look at your scores and things seemed to go fairly well um, within the three buildings. But then I, I also noticed that when, again, feeding into one building, um, I've sometimes heard staff say to me, oh, I can always tell which students went to this school or that school or, you know, we shouldn't be able to tell that they're coming from one school or another and we shouldn't be saying it, I think they're coming from this um, teacher or, you know, those, those statements shouldn't be happening. Um, it's certainly not good to have those divisive, but at the same token, as a teacher, I should be able to have the kids that have these, if we're giving them similar experiences, then they should be coming into me as the teacher at the middle school so that I'm actually, no, they, they should be blending in and seamlessly so that it doesn't stand out that way. And I, that's to me um, sort of, again, going back to that non-negotiable, I, I want to see that um, it's not always going to be exactly the same, what different students need, but they should have some similar experiences that they can all benefit from. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So the next topic we're going to go to is management. And so Chris, you're going yeah, to lead that one. Take this. Um, if the district were to decide to purchase online curriculum, say, and a large percentage of teachers were resistant to the change, how would you go about cultivating buy-in? Well, I think it's that pre-planning piece. I mean, I know it is. <laughs> um, I, I try to be very proactive versus reactive, and I, I'll give you a concrete example. Um, a couple of different examples. I was a curriculum liaison um, when I was a teacher. I always made sure that I, I was a technology liaison, curriculum liaison. And when we were getting ready to buy a new science um, purchase for our, our K-5 students, we came together, representatives from each building, and I worked with the science curriculum liaison, and we vetted, I think, three different programs together. The buy-in was because I was part of the full process and I was a re representative from my school, so that when I went back to the teachers that I worked with, I was able to keep them all along the way, all year while I was working with the team. I was the person that was connecting with them and letting them know what we were doing and what was happening so that when it got to that actual pur purchase at the end of the year in the summertime, the staff at my building were on board because they were listening to the work that I was doing with them. And I've seen it go the opposite way. I can recall um, when I first started in Weymouth in 2013, there was a lot of, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 2013, there were a lot of struggles with uh, purchases the curriculum supports had not been in place for quite a while. And at the very end of the previous school year, the town had found some one-time funds, that supplementary funds that they were going to give to the schools in the hundreds of thousands to buy um, a new reading um, support and a new math support for K-8, I believe, at the time. Well, I arrived in August, and I'm finding out all these nuances. And what I found um, out was that they didn't pilot the program. They were given uh, the couple of administrators over the summer decide they were going to go with Read Reading Street and Envision because they had the finances for it. They had to spend the money quickly because when the town gives it, you got to spend it. And I understand that's important. But because it wasn't rolled out and planned for you know a year ahead, which I think you really need to do to do it well and get that buy-in, there was a lot of resistance. And I remember going to visit classrooms and I, I'd walk through and I'd see. Sometimes I go through three or four second grade classrooms and I'd see, oh, isn't that great? They have their smart boards and they're all in the same lesson. But truth be told, you cannot all be on the same lesson if you're all working with different learners and the pacing might be different. Going back to that non-negotiable, you definitely need to have an expectation that you're all trying to um, meet the timelines of the standards. 
but in a day in a classroom you're still going to see differences that you might not be able to have the same lesson at the same time and that's what that resource and the way it was rolled out kind of led to um, and we've been able to since then purchase other materials but it goes back to that planning piece anytime you're implementing something new or starting a new initiative I really want to work with the union representatives I want to work with some key players from each school and say what do we want to work on together how are we going to get there together this is where we need to get so how can we do it together and how can I, how can you support the work that we need to do and not jam it down their throats and not micromanage because if you try to push too hard you're going to get that resistance and it's not good for children and that's why we're all here so it, you know pre-planning is so critical but going back to that five-year strategic plan if we've taken the time to do a good job on that process and lined up the budget to go with it so that I say we're hoping to do more to improve math and we need math coaches K-8, let's just say we decide. And I've, I've looked at the building and we, we determined together that we need five. But year one, we can't afford five because it's a significant cost. So maybe we do one per year over the five-year plan. And then we line up your budget with it. We line up the professional development that goes along with that. There then should not be surprises for staff. There shouldn't be surprises for parents. There shouldn't be surprises for you or me. Um, so I think the buy-in will happen a lot more significantly if we can do a process like that rather than trying to each year kind of start all over again. And again, that's why I really like to work with the principals about lining up their school improvement plans that way. And if they have that same five-year planning process, then it's, it's, here it is. It's all laid out. Here's the work we need to do together. Thank you. Um, no, I mean, that was a pretty conclusive I answer. Please. I did have a question that's just related to the topic, the management topic. Uh, again, going back to your opening statement, um, you mentioned that you uh, are particularly trying to be involved in evaluations of new administrative staff. I mean, obviously, it sort of seems obvious why you would do that. But what are you looking for? What What are you finding that you that 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 requires a little more attention for that mm -hmm. type, for that staff? It definitely varies um, from the different people I'm working with. But I also have um, evaluated for my career here um, the director of technology as well as the coordinator of health services. So on top of my um, five of the 12 principles that I've evaluated every year, I have a lot of other departments that I've evaluated as well, but different tools that I'm using with them. Um, so one of the things I, I like to do is start the year. I mean, I really like to sit down and just say, what is it that you want to work with for your, what do you want to do for your personal growth this year? And everybody usually has an idea of what they want to work on, even our new administrators are in as well. And I've, I've evaluated a lot of veterans as well. And that's a whole different conversation because if they're stuck in their ways, maybe I want to help kind of guide them as well. Um, I've also found that sometimes um, in just visiting or observing, there might be some conversations that I've had because I, I like to visit PLCs that principals are sitting in on. I like to visit, sometimes I've asked a, um, an administrator, if I can come observe them giving feedback to a teacher, I'm not there as an evaluator of the teacher, and the, and the teachers know that, so they're fine with it. Um, and then the administrator will give their feedback, and then I'll kind of talk about, could you have had that conversation in a different way? And, and I think that's a really good way to calibrate and help support them with their growth. But uh, you know, one example I can give is that I had a particular administrator that um, he had been assistant principal in another district. He came to us um, with little special ed background, and sometimes, depending on your track, that can happen uh, with some of our administrators. And he ended up being delegated, his school had been delegated to have an integrated K program. Some of the students had been in sub-separate in preschool and were significantly impaired. Um, some of our life school students, life skill students were being transferred into this program and just there were a lot of needs in that class. Um, probably too many needs and which is why I was not in favor of the model and we did change it after that. But there were some kids that were very physical and some that were trauma sensitive and a lot of dynamics that were taking place in the classroom. And when I started helping to support this administrator, he didn't really know a lot about special education. So I said to him, this is gonna be your goal now. Let's work, this is gonna be goal for year one. How can I support and uh, make sure my students are supported properly in an inclusive environment? And what I did that year is I put together a timeline with him of I wanted to set up meetings so that he'd work with the special ed department. He uh, kind of had the, I had him work with the special ed administrator and she coached him on that. And I found his growth was significant that year because it was really, we did it together collectively and I didn't tell him what to do, we decided together, but he, he was able to grow in that area. So that's just one example. Um, you know, I've had a lot of successes, but not all. You know, there are some, some people um, struggle to 
build their capacity. And I also think sometimes the role is not meant for everyone, and we need to figure that out um, sooner than later in the best yeah. interest of students. Thanks. Okay. Thank to think up all the time. Well, that's fine. So uh, let's move on to community engagement. Janine? All right. My favorite topic. Increasingly, there's debates that happen on social media, mm -hmm. and sometimes they fire, and other times they're not so much, um, specifically concerning school-related issues. If you heard on of an issue arising on so social media, how would you address it? It definitely would depend on the issue, but you know, we see this constantly, you know, the open forum where, you know, it's, it's really easy to bash um, administration or bash a teacher or bash a student or bully someone from behind your safe um, typing on a keyboard or on your phone. And I just think that's um, the, for me, I think it's what more can we do to educate students so that they know how to use the tools properly. And, and I, we spend so much time trying to teach them how to use the tools and making sure that they're um, getting the right information from the different sites they're on and we try to teach them to be civic minded and try to have them um, be support one another but inadvertently there's, there's going to be an opportunity where kids do go after other kids on social media and sometimes um, I've seen parents attack students or teachers and it's it's quite a challenge um, I've also been in circumstances where I've had um, some of our teaching staff post some things that are really not um, to me in the best interest of um, a preschool teacher or a high school teacher to be putting that information out on social media. So I, I, I like to think there are better ways that we, we need to do more to educate our parent population and our student population and our staff. How can we get them to understand um, how to use the tools wisely, but also to use them um, to benefit the schools versus to attack the schools? Are there ways to encourage anonymous reporting within the schools and within the district so that people feel that they have an avenue to discuss concerns they have so that they're not so quick to jump on social media. Um, as a superintendent, I would want to make sure that I'm available to meet with parent forums, to meet with student forums, so that I can help maybe promote some of that as well. Um, I do think it's important for all of us as administrators to make sure we're visible uh, with our students and you know greeting parents at the doors, um, being out and about in the community, so that you hope that people have the um, understanding that they're not really helping the schools when they start to say negative things on, on media platforms. But um, once it's out there, you can't really take it back. So uh, I, I, do, I don't really love to have to um, monitor some of the social media that's happening in, in the town, but I, sometimes you do have to know what's going on so that you can maybe reach out to a particular parent and diffuse the situation. And it comes down to having um, a good a lot of tools in your repertoire. Uh, I, because I handle a lot of uh, investigations and legal matters, I've had to diffuse a lot of situations and I think um, making sure that you can de-escalate a situation. But the other piece, you know, this is where I always say, I really trust my administrators to make decisions for their buildings and I really want to support them. But as a superintendent, you need to make sure that if something is blowing up in the school or they are, f are thinking that something might, or just kind of hearing rumblings, to reach out to me right away so that I'm, I'm there to support them, um, not to help them manage it necessarily unless I need to. But I would not want a school committee, to, for example, to reach to me and say, why didn't you do something about this? And then I have no idea. It's not helpful for any of us. So I encourage that constant communication with one another. Again, not in a, um, in a role of me trying to take over for the building administrators, but making sure that I can help support them so that if things do start to bubble up, that I'm aware of a situation and I can help diffuse the situation. Very good. Okay, um, what is your experience working with the police, fire, and parent organizations? So with my current role, um, the way I work with the parent organizations is I try to um, engage them as much as possible to sit on my family engagement committee. What I did was, um, you know, as I mentioned to you, that some of our parent councils at some of the buildings were more rigorous and had a lot more supports and also financial supports and enrichment opportunities in some of our other buildings. So I reached out to our townwide parent council leaders and I said, can you get in a, a, someone from each building to come be part of my family engagement committee? I wasn't successful at getting um, someone from all of the buildings. But I was successful of getting for about five years. I had three or four consistent parents that were coming and sitting on that team for me. Um, 
one of them the other night who has been she's been my guard person at my big culminating event. Sometimes I've done that full steam ahead at the beginning of the year, sometimes at the end of the year, and she's been the the guard. Um, taking the tickets, uh, you know, giving people all the information they needed, setting them up to on their journeys. So, you know, that's always a fun part of the, of the work that I can get them to be engaged. And we've also, I have a community liaison role in my district and she's fabulous. So she does a lot of work um, bringing different vendors in the community in and we get to meet together. Um, and sometimes I'll work with the Chamber of Commerce to help um, you know, some of the Chamber of Commerce members, our community members as well. and to see that they can kind of help support our schools in that respect. So that's kind of where the work that I've done with parents, organizations. But then the other piece is, um, you asked about my work on the town end. Um, for many of my years, I was the, um, when the superintendent could not attend a department chair meeting on the town side, um, I was sent to be the go-to person and I would meet with all of our key um, department heads and the mayor and chief of staff on the town end. And, Every month we have a meeting and uh, the public works director was there, our chief of police, our chief of fire, um, you name it, all the, all the key stakeholders. So we always would have, um, particularly when we got into the budget times, I like to try to be selling and marketing in those meetings. I was promoting some of the things we were doing on the school side so that when the number came over from the town side, from the school side to the towns and um, some of, sometimes our police chief was looking for um, more police staff or the fire chief was looking, but they were also hearing the needs of the school, so they weren't so quick to, um, you know, have that divisiveness, and we were working together very collectively. I've also been very fortunate um, overseeing safety and security that um, the public works leader and the um, chief of police and chief of fire, the fire chief have different times, have sat in on my safety meetings and um, helped us do a lot of the work to promote in the schools. Um, every month when I've had those meetings, uh, I have at least our SROs there or sometimes one of the police captains, different members, the deputy chief on the fire will come to those meetings. And I've really picked their brains about how can you help us uh, make sure we have safer schools. And they've been really great resources. Just recently, I was partnering with um, one of our deputy chiefs who has overseen safety on the fire side. And he has become, I started to, because I mentioned oh, having 12 buildings right now, it's challenging sometimes with the differences at the different buildings. And when we have safety situations, sometimes it be, might be nice to have another administrator at a different side of the town flood that building and try to support them during an evacuation or um, some difficult situation. So I had been working with a smaller team of my safety committee this year to develop a district emergency response team and it's just, it's all ready to go for the fall. We're doing a north and a south team so that if something happens on the north side, the south team is going to go flood. And then, uh, going back, because you asked about fire, not about so much safety, but the um, deputy chief has been coming to my smaller group meetings and really kind of looking at the work we've done and then he's helping us tweak some of that work. I, the more we can work together um, and, and I would want to make sure with the strategic planning process that our those department heads were, some of them would be able to be part of that work as well and, and working together collectively, building a vision together. The buy-in is there and, and, and there's, there should be that teamwork collaboration. Very good. Okay. So moving on to the budget section, this is my section. Um, so rather than talking about your experience or how you build the budget, more specifically, I feel like everybody has a strategic plan that they want to implement, mm -hmm. but there are often constraints. So how do you implement a strategic plan when you get level services funding year after year? Yeah, that's happened frequently. And, and that's why I do think that um, trying to, you know, uh, example of during the budget process, um, because we had lost adjustment counselors at all our primary schools and our middle schools needed more, you know, you know the, all the buildings needed more. So I was able to look at enrollment shifts and see I could use some of that, some of the shifts in enrollment that de decreased to kind of build back some of these positions. But when we were really trying to build some stronger programs and trying to bring some curriculum leadership back and, and bring some um, coaches back, that, that's where the, that five-year planning process is very helpful. Um, we have not done a strategic plan in Weymouth, and I would have loved to have had that opportunity, but we have been able to align our budget cycle for the five-year process. And that's one of the few ways when you're dealing with level services and trying to bring back just a few things slowly, slowly rather than trying to do it all at once. Um, and me coming to you and saying, I really think we need five more adjustment counselors, and I'll have to work on, okay, let's just put the one a year so that over five years it's not such a hit to the budget. I do think, um, Getting that whole buy-in process, you know, as I mentioned, working with the department heads on the town side, if they know where the vision is and they've developed the vision with, with us and they know we were trying to get in five years, 
then you hope that the town will be able to support those needs and not have to cut them that year if you've asked for certain things in the budget process. I know that's not always realistic, but I also think it's very important to be creative within the budget that you have to look for um, if, if you can't get the number to school committee and then to the town that you really need, um, that the district is recommending, then sometimes you have to be creative within the budget you have and, and look at some supports that might be able to tweak and slide over to other needy areas. So um, I've done a lot of work um, with budgeting. Uh, I also think it's important when you're working on this process to make sure that you have a capital plan that is um, fundable. Uh, I found that that was an area of struggle for us with our technology infrastructure and also with our, our facilities overall. We had capital planning in place, but there was a 10-year plan, and each year the same things were on that plan. It got to the point one time where our vans were getting rusted out and we were having holes in the floors, and they were, some of them had 200,000 miles, and I don't think any of us want to be transporting our special needs students or our, our small group learners to schools on unsafe vans. So sometimes it's really about really showing the exact needs, and we did physically show. We drove the vans over to Town Hall, left it for people to look at. Um, similar process, um, we've been working on an MSBA project for our middle, a new middle school that did finally get approved and literally inviting parents in to see um, the infrastructure and where the needs are so that when the vote comes out for, um, if it's a one-time funding or to get more funds from the town side and you can get the community support that way so that you're not <coughs> stuck in that situation and not be able to fund the things that you've asked for over the five year. Okay, thank you very much. So why don't we move on to leadership and vision, <coughs> Diana? Sure. Um, Obviously, school culture is really important. And in your opinion, how do you feel the superintendent role impacts school culture? That's one of the reasons I'm excited about um, the community of this size, because I love working. I think I was talking with one of the principals earlier about um, I love working with all ages. You know, um, as a teacher, there were things I loved about my eighth grade students. There were things I loved when I go to visit the preschoolers. I love talking to the high school students about the work they're doing. And I, you, you get different um, opportunities from all the different grade levels. As a superintendent, I want to be very visible and have open forums with students and have them, you know, um, our high school works very closely with their principal and associate principal and they have student advisory councils and the students meet with their leadership team at the high school and they put together different things that they want to work on as a student advisory team. I would love to be part of that work um, at the high school level and being coming in and meeting with students and hearing what they want for the school system. I think we really need to rely on the kids know what's going well and what's not going well. If we can start getting their voices to be heard uh, up to not just the administration at the building level, but also to the superintendent so that we can work on some of the things that they feel are not as effective um, in the district, I would want to make sure that I'm very integral in making sure I'm available. And I, that's the nice part with five buildings. I really feel I do have the opportunity to get myself in and out on a frequent basis. Uh, right now, I with 12 buildings, it's hard. I literally take my calendar at the beginning of the year and I map out one day a week that I'm going to be visiting four buildings out of the 12, so that on a three-week rotation I've tried to hit all 12 buildings. But as I mentioned, I think earlier to people that right now with a school of 1,800 students at the high school, even though I'm putting time there visiting, I'm certainly not getting as many connections with students and even with staff that I would like to have. In my smaller buildings, it's a lot easier. I can get through a building with 175 students and a small number of staff a lot quicker and hit them all and really make sure I'm engaging with them and helping. There's a lot you gather when you visit informally versus formally. Certainly those formal visits are important, making sure that I um, have coffee hours with parents, making sure I have um, before and after school hours for students, I mean, for, um, not just students, but staff to meet with me to talk about how things are going. I would want to make sure that happens. But I also think those informal visits give you a lot of information. When you're an administrator that's done it for a long time and you walk into classrooms, you can really sense the engagement very quickly. You can also get a sense of, um, you know, when there's apathy, you know, you know, those things in the classroom. So I like to be able to be out and about visiting classes quite a bit, not to be there in an evaluative role as an administrator to teachers, but in a way of how can I support and see what's going great in the schools and other things that we can improve on together. And then that translates into how we work on school improvement plans and district improvement plans together. Great. Thank you. And when you think about 
leadership of your administrative team, are there certain traits that you would look for in an administrative team or in expectations that you might have um, that are a standard for you with that team? For I think it's really, I mean, we all have different personalities and you know, with a large leadership team like I have, there are certain administrators that probably, um, you know, there were certain characteristics that you resonate with more than others, different, given your own personality type. But collectively, I want to make sure that we all are able to be able to trust one another and have mutual respect. Those are the first and foremost things that I would expect from the leadership team, because we all have different leadership styles. And um, the, one of the other things I've found with my years of experience is there's not one way, right way to do things. Um, so. You know, I mentioned earlier about administrators coming to me when they need support or just to give me a heads up that something is brewing so that I can help support them. It doesn't mean I'm gonna have to jump in. But, you know, there have been times when I have had information and I've thought about if I have to get involved, this is how I would handle it. And then the administrator comes to me and says, this is what I've done. What I've learned is my way isn't necessarily the right way or my way is not necessarily the only way. So I, w I really like to try to give the opportunity to help support administrators but make sure that they're doing things the way and that they're learning from maybe any mistakes that they might make and I'm supporting their growth in that uh, in that manner because um, I've worked with a top-down leadership style and it certainly doesn't work for me. I really feel that we need to have autonomy together, um, have a safe environment so that, you know, as I mentioned with teachers, if teachers are struggling, they need to be able to go to their administrators for support. If my administrative team is struggling, I want them to be able to see me as a resource, not as someone that's going to catch them and um, trip them up, because that's not, to me, one of the most important things you do as a superintendent. Obviously, there's so many with school safety and supporting students and supporting the budget and managing facilities, but I, I truly feel one of the most important things that you can do to stamp your lens on and support staff is by the evaluative cycle and making sure that you're instrumental in supporting your growth of your leadership capacity. Um, you know, we, we all learn differently, we all um, act differently. You know, we've done a lot of work as a leadership team around who's a north, south, east, and west. And I think it's important to get a sense of our differences and similarities so that we know how to work together. But even if we don't always agree on things, we have to have a respectful and mutually respectful um, environment to work in. And I, I always want, you know, I've had many administrators come to me and tell me that if they didn't agree with a certain decision, they don't have a problem telling me that, and I don't have a problem hearing that, because sometimes I might have more information that I can't share collectively from the district level, um, and I might know something that a reason went into a, de a decision that I had to make. But if they can come voice the concerns, and then we can exit that room and agree to disagree publicly, support one another, that's really critical, and, if, and, I, and that's how I'm gonna be. I will never, ever discredit an administrator. I will always, even if something did not go well, and I felt that they should have handled it differently, that's a learning opportunity. That's not an opportunity to um, criticize. Um, I, with, all the, with all the different feedback opportunities I've had in my various roles, um, you know, I was actually working with one of our new administrators. He um, is a director of curriculum, and he asked me to mentor him for his assistant superintendent license recently. And I, as I was talking with him, he, he just, we just finished the work. I met with him and his supervisor at the college level. We had a really nice conversation. And one of the things that I was talking with him about is, you will never, ever hear me raise my voice to a staff member. We have to be respectful. I've had people raise their voice to me. <laughs> and um, that's not how I operate, because yelling at someone and criticizing someone isn't going to help their and support their growth but having conversations and asking what I could do. Or sometimes it's as simple as, what might you do differently next time now that this happened? Those are really good learning opportunities that we can have together. Thank you. What, what does the administrative team look like at Weymouth right now? You've, you've talked about a few different positions. I'm just curious, like, what is the team of administrators right now? Sure, so it's, um, there's been some reorganization, including my position, which is becoming a director of HR. Um, so two assistant superintendents under the superintendent, a director of STEM, a director of humanities, and again, the budget's just changing, so we're in the process of hiring uh, four assistant directors. We had piloted doing, uh, this all came back very recently within mm -hmm. the last two years. We had no curriculum support except for the one assistant superintendent role for a number of years since about 2008. So it's very exciting to get back some of these leadership um, positions. So the, we had, 
for one year we had assistant directors that were for each content area, but they were teaching assistant directors, seven through 12, that were teaching two classes at the high school and then supporting curriculum development. And then the superintendent just changed that model after piloting um, to add, um, they're no longer gonna be teaching, but we'll have the four assistant directors under the two curriculum directors that are um, one STEM, one humanities, one um, of the arts, and one social emotional is a new position that we're really trying out. So, and then under that we have our 12 principals and one associate principal at the high school and deans and assistant principals at the middle and high school level as well. Okay, thank you. Um, let me circle back a little bit to budgeting um, and focus a little more on the revenue side as we might say in the private sector. Um, <laughs> um, what opportunities have you had to sort of seek out uh, 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 sort of alternative funds, <laughs> um, whether it be working with uh, community members or the state, or have you done any sure. kind of that kind of work? Yeah, most of the work I've done personally um, to increase revenue is around grants, um, writing grants, and you know, as I mentioned, safety is a big part of what I was asked to do in in one of my roles. So. Um, each year I was asked to do a ton of work around safety and I have zero in my budget. <laughs> so there's no line item for safety, yet the needs of the buildings were so significant. And when I started, um, we had this, I mentioned this large high school and it, it had a um, lovely security desk, but, and we were running IDs so that when people were entering the building, they were running the IDs. So God forbid a sex offender entered the building that would get screened out and then printing labels at our large building so they'd have an ID when they were walking in. But one of the things that struck me immediately was it was great that I was walking in and I could go over the security desk and even if I had my ID on, they w everybody was already in the building <laughs> before this, you hit the security desk. And on a busy day, I literally could walk right by and nobody even saw me. So I didn't even have to have an ID, it doesn't, doesn't matter, nobody was looking at me. That really struck a chord with me about how we're talking about all the school safety work that we need to do and have no funding for it. And then I found out we had security cameras that were literally just um, dummies. So they were up on the wall, but nothing's playing there because we had, again, with no budget, what are you gonna do? So that set me off on working with the superintendent and um, the mayor to find out, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes some one-time supplementary funds come over from the town. And fortunately that first year, I was able to get them to help support us with some um, cameras at the high school and then also to um, help us put in a FOB system so that all the buildings had the, you know, the buzzer system. But it didn't help my security entrances. So within the last five years, I've been able to work with my maintenance department. And I'm excited that we are now at, uh, I think it's 12 out of the 13, including the administration building, will have been all set up so that nobody gets into the building after the, once the doors are closed for the morning, when students are coming in, nobody can enter the building without stopping at a security desk before they enter, showing an ID. You know, it takes a little bit more time, but it's a lot safer entering those buildings. And I've had people tell me sometimes it may not be as welcoming, but given the climate that we're in and the times that we have, having two minutes to find out if a parent is escalated and asking them to wait in the, sit down for a minute in the um, hallway there is, I don't think, uh, a really, big deal to ask because once they're in the building, they're very welcome to come and visit us. Uh, so that's with no money, uh, struggling. So I looked at um, you know, our maintenance budget with our building use fees every year and then also when we've had some funding left over from energy efficiencies that we've added with lighting and so forth, my maintenance department, because we do have staff that can do a lot of the work, was able to fund most of that process. But then I did have to look to some outside funds through grants and I wrote a couple of safety grants and I think I got one for 25,000, maybe another for 20. Small bits and pieces, but it's, we do a lot with a little and I'm very creative as how I use those funds. And in my previous work as a curriculum leader, I wrote a ton of grants, grants that sometimes funded professional development or sometimes infrastructure and, and resources. So I'm, I'm very familiar with that on the community end. I am fortunate that I have a lovely woman that I work with who was a parent and then a paraprofessional and then this role was created and it's not, she does not make a lot of money for the amount of work she does. She is our community liaison and she's the one that I rely on. She seeks out all of the community supports that we um, work on together and I work with her regularly to help her do the work that she needs to do but I truly rely on her expertise because she's, she's created so many, um, She's networked with so many different groups and she's gotten so many people to want to support our schools that 
uh, people are lining up and doing wonderful work, and it's free of charge, which is always the best case scenario. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions, guys? Right around the end. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for coming in today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Oh. Okay. The motion to Move into make a motion to recess. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. 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 Seconded. Aye. Back into re open session. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Dabble Unanimous. The crowd down. <laughs> okay, so first and foremost, Dr. Daly, welcome to North Reading. <laughs> Thank you for traveling here. Thank you for considering the position. Um, you know, all joking aside, I think everyone in this room understands how difficult the job of superintendent is. I think you certainly understand that. And, you know, regardless of what happens, we are all extremely appreciative that you're even considering this job because I don't know many people that really want want this type of job anymore it's so much work and you know it, and you don't get the credit that super superintendents don't get the credit they deserve and so thank you very much for considering it thank okay you. so in terms of the process tonight so we're gonna begin with just an opening statement I think mrs. Imbriano said to you that we were gonna look for in that statement to talk a little bit about you know, your vision for North Reading and the next five-year strategic plan. After that, we've identified five crucial responsibilities of a superintendent. Our hope is to have an interactive discussion about um, each of those. Each of us is gonna lead the discussion on one of those. Um, we have a couple of questions to begin that discussion, and if there's time, we'll have some back and forth on that. Uh, we're gonna limit each section to about 10 minutes, and I will serve as a bit of a timekeeper. So that's it. So. At this time, I would like to give you the time for a brief opening statement, and if you could, please speak to your vision about North Reading, specifically commenting on topics you would seek to address in the next five-year strategic plan. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being a part of this important process. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity with the committee and, and with, with the folks here tonight. Um, I know I shared a lot of my thoughts last, last week and, and, and again tonight, um, but in many ways, I would like to think that I've been somewhat sharing my thoughts and auditioning in some ways for this role for, for 10 years, being in this district. I think uh, folks have seen a lot of the things I've been involved in, and uh, I, as I said last time, I, think, I like to think that a lot of the great things that are happening in North Reading right now, I, I'm involved in in some way, shape, or form. I think you'll see everything from um, you know, helping put some of the names on the website to setting up phones to being involved in some of the big uh, personnel decisions at the district level. I, I think I've been involved in many different things. Of course, all the curriculum and technology and helping to put together this great school. So I hope that that reputation precedes me and um, I'm sure you've spoken to folks and um, my vision for the district. So as I've said before, we have a fantastic strategic plan. We have, um, it's called NRPS 2021, prior to that NRPS 2016. When Kathy Willis brought that idea here, we started, I was just speaking with Principal O'Connell about this, right? When, when she first came in, we did the whole five-year plan out, backwards design, which it was just a great process. We came up with a new mission, a new vision statement. Um, that's not something that I'm looking to redo. I think I still believe in our mission. I believe in our, our vision. I think that we have, we are headed in the right direction. And my, my role here is to take it even further. You know, when I, I, I refer to Jim Collins all the time on my opening day uh, address to the staff, and I always speak about going from good to great. And I, I really would, would say at this point, we are very good. We've got schools of commendation. We have level one schools. We have, you know, our high school, our middle school are, are doing fantastic things. Our arts are unbelievable. Our sports teams, um, I think we're very good, but there's always room for improvement. And so that's, that's where I see us going. So some of the things I'm going to talk about here um, are in progress already, but they're things that I would want to update our plan. Some of this is work that we're going to be doing this summer, um, and I'm going to speak to that. Some of the things uh, might have a cost to it, and I just want to be upfront about that. I'm well aware that some of these things may have a cost, and I'm going to pursue those things um, because I think if they're the right thing to do for kids, if they're the right thing for students, then I think we deserve to look at them and vet every possible option and find the ways to make them happen. So I am well aware of some of those costs as well. But the first thing that comes to mind, I think, is with curriculum. Um, one, of my, one of my main passions and a part that I do with my job now, I'm thinking about technology, digital, digital literacy. We speak all the time about the jobs that we're preparing our students for don't exist yet. Right? And we talk about what those fields are and, and how they're emerging. The last several years, we've 
increased our digital learning offerings. The students now in third, fourth grade are doing what we used to do in eighth grade, and that's changing every year. Kindergartners now are interacting with robots and using computer science techniques in classrooms. So we're going to continue to build that. Middle school, we're very excited. We're going to be offering a new course for sixth graders, and then the following year, hopefully for seventh graders, this course is going to make every single student get exposed to computer science and move ahead with that. That's going to allow us to create new courses at the high school that are going to involve advanced robotics, courses like video game design, courses like computer animation. These are the jobs that are awaiting our students when we get out there and we want to engage all of our students and a lot of our non-traditional students. Right now we have these courses and they're electives and it's a small group of students who take them. Um, we want to get all of our students engaged in some of these courses because just about every job that you're in in the future is going to be uh, involving technology in some way. And I used to teach video production as one of the courses I taught as a teacher. And I used to say this isn't just for folks going in to be in front of the camera anymore. Everybody that can use video, I was also a writing teacher, everybody can use writing in their profession. And I think that's really where we are with those subjects, but also with technology and with computer science because it's such a part of what we're doing. I also think about mathematics. Um, our, our curriculum leader, Derek Dorval, Mike Rosa, our, our guidance director, um, have been looking at exploring pathways for mathematics. A lot of the thinking around mathematics right now is that calculus is not necessarily the top of that pyramid, and it's certainly not the top of the pyramid for every student. So we want to have more advanced coursework like um, quantitative reasoning, advanced quantitative reasoning, and statistics, and dis uh, business and data analytics are huge fields and huge jobs. So we really want to explore that, and I want to be one of the districts that's out at the forefront of exploring that, um, that shift that's happening across the state in mathematics. I was a part of a conversation with, this, with the state. They brought in higher ed, they brought in uh, K-12. Mike and Derek were there as well, as long as some math teachers from the high school. So I'm very excited about that. That's just one example of something that I want to make sure gets into our plan this summer. Also, um, at the other end, the literacy, right? If we, we know between K to three, if students aren't able to read by grade three, they're not gonna be able to read science. They're not gonna be able to read math. They're not gonna be able to read history books. So we have to get that early literacy. And there's a big movement at, at the state level to increase and change some of the assessments we're using to better define and identify the needs of our youngest students. And so we're going to do, we're writing a grant right now to explore um, uh, a, new, a new program for, um, right now we're putting it for the little school to pilot it for a year because everyone's gonna have to change some of their assessments for next year. So we're gonna get that language into and, and sort of our transition plan to that new illiteracy uh, standard at the elementary school. So that's happening as well. I certainly wanna explore our performing arts our arts, our physical education, all of those programs, I'm so blessed that I get to observe those folks. It's really the best part of what I do is getting into those classrooms, working closely with those teachers, and I want to keep enhancing those programs and making sure we're supporting them. We have one of the m most robust programs that I've been to. When I go into a theater, I bring all my kids with me and we watch these Broadway-style shows. That's something that we're definitely going to continue to support as well. Um, so as far as the, the vision plan, there's three big rocks, and I don't see those changing right now. Those are it's teaching and learning, it's uh, technology, and it's student support. So when I think about the whole child social-emotional learning, one of the things I want to make sure we're doing is in the next five years is taking those SEL. We have ambassadors right now, sort of that early majority that have learned. We need to get that next wave. We need to train those trainers so they get back into the classrooms, work with our principals so that every teacher and every student has this uh, approach to social emotional learning that we did last year with, with a group of about 25, 30 folks. Um, I also want to continue our professional development around uh, universal design for learning and make sure we strengthen that as well. That's something that a lot of teachers have taken hold to with our coaching model. We have one coach for multiple districts, so I want to strengthen that and move that forward and make sure that's in our plan. Um, so also under uh, support services, MTSS. So MTSS is the Massachusetts Tiered System of Support, and it's much more than special education. It actually touches on everything, including finance. This is something that I've been talking about with since Kathy Willis was here and, and about two or three PPS directors ago. Um, I think this is something that I really want to make sure it gets into our vision to craft forward, because we need a one system of support that in a common language across all of the schools. Middle school has really taken on that language of MTSS as sort of a pilot of looking at that, but I want to make sure we have that common language, common understanding across the district. And Cynthia Conan's well down this road already leading this, but that's something I want to see really articulated in our tech plan. So something else that, that's really on my mind that uh, this is one of those ones that I know costs money, um, but it's worth it for the kids with the standards we have in first grade right now. 
Um, the expectations for students in kindergarten, I would, I would want to get into our vision plan, a full, uh, free full day kindergarten for all students in North Reading. I know that's uh, definitely has challenges and I fully understand the reasons why that hasn't happened yet. But I do think this is one of those growth mindsets and I want to start phrasing it with a yet. I want to explore it fully. I want to vet it. I want to look at funding options, possibilities. And, and, and really, it might come back to the community. It might take more than five years. It might take longer. But if that's something that's right for kids um, and if it's right for this community, then it's something that I really would want to supp uh, support and explore. So for me, those are some of the big issues and big pieces of the vision that would, that would be updated this summer. Um, I think a lot of other pieces that are in there right now, educator value, Evaluation, curriculum leadership, those pieces will continue to develop. But those are some slightly new directions that I could see myself taking if I were to be superintendent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so first topic we have is student learning. And Rich. I don't know if you're at all interested in student learning or not. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Just why we're here. Uh, so we we'll, could we'll give you an opportunity to, 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 to see if you can speak to this at all. Sure. Uh, um, so. We've been asking, how can a district support all learners in a classroom without penalizing any of them? And I would just add that we mean any of them. So speak to all different levels of learners. So, mm -hmm. so how can we support all learners without penalizing any of them? For especially f from the di yeah, exactly. Yeah. What can the so I, I think there's a lot of keys here. And so when I first learned, and I, I'll use the term differentiation. So. I believe in this differentiation concept so that you're finding, you know, it's not one size fits all and we're trying to differentiate. What you soon realize and what I realize as a teacher is I have 25 students and I have 25 individual learners. How can I possibly differentiate everything I do for every single student? And that's one of the challenges, right? It's one of the, it's one of the frustrations of the classroom. And I, and I think what this question is getting at is you've got learners at all different places. We want to be fully included, but there are some students that are going to learn at a different pace than other students. And we don't want to hold some students back, and we also want to make sure other students are fully included. This is where personalized learning and this is where un, uh, universal design for learning come in. So universal design is at the, at the top of the framework, and we are just at the, at the stages where we're learning this as a district and trying to understand it. But it's one of those things that, like both of these concepts, it's going to take a little while to, to learn, but once we get over that hump as a district and we understand it and we start thinking this way, it's going to make everything a lot easier, from communication to, to frustration in the classroom. Our goal is, as educators is to make sure every student learns in the way that is best for that student. And so... Universal design would be the teacher designing the lesson, not one size fits all, but from the, from the very outset, designing the learning so that it's accessible to every student and they, they can access it in what they need. It's not just giving you know, extra work to a student who, who, is, who is a high achiever and extra help to a student that, that needs help. It's coming up with different ways for them to approach the same task to meet the objective and to meet an objective that's, that's uh, tied into what they need personally. So personalized learning kind of intersects with this. So I see this as a big piece of what I want to frame um, for our professional development uh, for the future is this intersection of universal design and also personalized learning. Personalized learning is where the students are more aware and involved of their own personalized learning goals. They're understanding the um, expected outcomes of the course, but the teacher, it's really about relationships. The teacher's understanding how does this student learn best. It can be everything from the environment to, you know, some students um, love to, you know, I like to listen to music when I do work. Other students, they cannot listen to music. How do you, how do you find something in an environment to make it so that some kids can listen to music and some kids don't have to? That's an extreme example, but that's an example. Um, I see technology as a huge inroad here because without having, and I'm also a big believer in smaller class sizes and a big believer in if you've got multiple adults in a room, let's make sure that we're using them to their full advantage so that you know, I'm a big believer in co-teaching as opposed to a teacher with someone, you know, sometimes you go into a classroom, not, not, not necessarily North Reading, but you might see four adults in a room, but there's really one person leading and, one, and three other people just working with one or two kids. There are ways to set up stations, there's ways to move around the room um, and set things up. And I see technology as a huge piece here. If you can somehow, you know, flip the classroom, break down the lessons, have students able to watch a lecture on a video and play it back at their own speed. Now you've got a small group doing this. Maybe you're using another technology over here, and then the teacher can work in a small group. So you could, there's ways to differentiate and cut those class sizes down in different ways. And we're doing a lot of these things, and we're doing them well. But I think we need to get our teachers out to see other schools and also into classrooms within our school to see how these things are working really well. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of potential in, in using uh, video and being able to watch 
like that flip classroom idea where instead of when the, the, the best opportunity we have to do creative things with kids all together is during the school day. So that's not the best time for them to be sitting in a desk listening to a lecture. So if they can get some of that content and engage with it at home, or they can take a few minutes and catch up on their own, and we're able to, um, to get them working in groups, collaborating, doing all those things, I think there's a huge potential for some of those high achievers. That the, the best way for a high achiever to really learn something is to reteach it. So if we can get opportunities in, 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 our, in our classes where students are working together in groups and helping teach one another, that's the best opportunity for someone who's struggling and someone who's a high achiever to work together. So those are some of the ideas that I have. And, and how does that tie together year to year? Like, uh, or how do you envision tying together year to year as a student moves through the, 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 from grade to grade? And how do you maintain that, that continuity in terms of their, their needs? So st the student experience, or yeah, yeah I, I think the more um, the more that students can, you know, basically every student really needs an individualized program, you know, where students can identify these are my goals for the year, this is how I learn best, and for us to start those questions. So the the high school we've really taken this on this year, and we've talked about each ninth grader set their own personalized learning goals, and the next steps now are for those students to sit with teachers next year and say, here's how I learn best, here's what I want to do. I love this course idea, but I really like, you know, I really like making short movies. Is there any way I can have an opportunity instead of writing that that second paper to maybe do a short film or, you know, and within within that realm to have those questions with teachers and to move forward. I think obviously students who are on IEPs as we traditionally know them, obviously that's the transition from year to year and that consistency is there. But I think one of the things that's very important is, like I mentioned, if, if teachers are sharing best practices from year to year, I know as a student, I felt like every year, every class, I had to learn something different. I had to put my name in the top left corner in this class, in the top right corner in that class. And, but the more we can move those barriers for kids and try to come up with what's consistent, what's most essential, um, and, and try to standardize that, I think that's really important. And we have to do all this without teachers feeling like this is one more thing, which is really hard to do, right? But I think that, like I said before, if we can show, and this is what our teachers are excited for, they wanna be shown how this works well, put in the time and effort, and they're willing to do that, and then it's gonna pay dividends, because our goal is to get all kids to learn and to learn at a high level, and I think when you start seeing that happen, it's, it's worth its weight in gold, because you're not reteaching, you're not getting frustrated, you're not saying, oh, I know I taught that, but they didn't learn it. If we really teach to mastery and they're getting to that point, um, they're gonna be much less frustrated from year to year. Okay, thanks. Um, does anybody else have you want Yeah, to yeah. Um, so, uh, I've, I've heard from you just a lot of uh, great ideas uh, of how to transform classrooms and get kids learning on um, on deeper levels. But one that I want to touch on was uh, your idea of a flipped classroom, this concept yeah. that kids are using that time in school to do things that they couldn't do out of school. Yeah. Right. And philosophically, I think that's an, an excellent idea. But as a classroom teacher, I see a large number of kids, even if I can get them inspired in the classroom when they leave, it's left their brain and and they don't have the the I don't even know what the qualities are but it's difficult for them to come in having thought about class outside of class mm -hmm. how would you go about coaching teachers on how to deal with that or helping kids get over that type of hurdle yeah I think well I mean I think some of what we're talking about here is homework right and there's a there's a lot of, of great research out there about homework homework has a value but it has to be the right homework and it has to be engaging so there, there are ways to, and I think in today's classroom, you're competing with a lot, right? You're competing with a lot of entertainment factors. The, the attention span of the kids is very short. My kids don't know what television is. They just watch YouTube clips, right? There's a lot of great ways to gamify and to make things really exciting, incentive, incentives for kids. I think, um, and, and again, flip classroom is just one approach, but, but since you brought that one up, I would say I think there's ways to make those videos exciting and engaging. Research shows that if the teacher makes the videos himself, it's actually even more engaging than watching like a Khan Academy or mm -hmm. something that's, that's already been created. Um, and I think there's some great teachers that are doing that here um, and have been doing it for many years. We did some book groups years ago, and, and, and you know, I think that's the way to get other teachers to see that is to see how that's working and have them share their experiences. I don't know that you do it every single day day um, but if that's the homework if the homework is and again I'm not saying you watch a 45 minute lecture but you go home watch three or four minutes engage in something from home maybe you're, you're answering some questions maybe there's some interaction um, with your classmates that way and that becomes the homework 
um, it's a little bit lighter. It's not like you're going home and, you know, I, I remember doing like two through 80 even in my math book, right? right? And it took me all night. If you're engaging with some videos and getting into something and maybe exploring some things, giving, giving students a little more choice about how they even approach that work, um, I think that's, that would be my advice to work with a teacher on some homework. But again, what I always say to teachers is try it once. If it fails, try it again, talk to some other people. But if you try to think of it as, oh my God, I have to flip every single thing I do. I, my brother's a teacher and he's a history teacher and we talk all the time. Lecture has a place, don't get me wrong. Rows have a place, quiet has a place. But I still think there's a lot of opportunity for some of these new cutting edge ideas in the classroom. So um, I would say to you as a, as a teacher, um, I, I would love to have you come in and, and go up to Miss Kerrigan's room. She's doing a great job with it. She's been doing it for 10 years. I'm sure there's little things you could pick up there, things you could give her. and, and that would be my advice and I love cross-district collaboration I love getting people in the classrooms we work with uh, Maple we did a great learning tour we had districts come into our district we get out to districts and see that's that's the real secret there's there's books you can read there's places you can go but when you're actually in the classroom I always say you know a, as an observer I say I'd be doing oh, that's awesome I'm stealing it or I'd say I can actually do that better and it makes me feel like a better teacher and to me that's one of the big things I would want to see is I want to get our principals and our teachers you know, we need to be here, but we need to get out and see a little bit and come back, and, and that's how we're going to get to greatness. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I, I, I have a follow-up that's a little bit off, off point here, but so you're clearly the curriculum leader in our district right now. Superintendent is a different role. Mm -hmm. Are you envisioning trying to keep some of that role and changing the superintendent role a bit and finding something different in an assistant, or are you are – you, willing or, or, or planning on passing that responsibility off to somebody else? It's a great question. Um, I, I think, you know, Kathy Willis was a curriculum person before. Uh, David Troughton was a curriculum person. Uh, John was a building principal for many years, and he definitely was a teacher and a curriculum person as well. Um, it, it's different. You know, so the dynamics of, uh, you know, has it crossed my mind what might happen if, 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 if this works out for me? Um, absolutely, and so I've, I've given a lot of thought to what would what would happen. I my role was for a year when I took the job as the director of academic services, curriculum and technology. Um, the technology part was on the table because they said, "How are we going to possibly open a school with you doing both jobs?" And and I, I understood that it's two big jobs, and every year it was in the budget, and every year it didn't happen. And then some years it was in there, and then we, we kept getting creative. We said, okay, we can't get that, but let's get one digital learning. And we chipped away at it. So now we have a digital learning person at every single building. Um, we built this entire school where I spent four or five days a week <laughs> um, figuring out all the technology in all the rooms, and then also doing PD and also doing curriculum. So my point, though, is when we did hire Dr. Downs a few years ago, and we spun that role off, um, I, I've said to him you know, many, many times that it's, it's difficult because I, I now am still here, <laughs> you know, so everything that he goes to, we, we, we collaborate on everything as I think we would, but it's, it's difficult to, to completely let that go because I've built something here and I want to make sure he understands, but there's a lot of history here. That's why that happened that way and I want to make sure it goes that way. So being in the superintendent role, John, John and I have a very different approach. John um, does everything that he does and, and he kind of lets me do what I need to do. I t completely understand that I'm going to need to let someone else come into that role and take it over, but I'm going to be definitely still involved and in helping to shape and guide, especially to handoff. And again, what John is able to do with this, what I call the gift of, of this long, uh, from, J from July until January for a transition, I would see that same transition with my role as well. So I'll be able to help bring that person along and get them to do some things. Um, I certainly would approach, there are certain things I'm just going to do differently just because it's, it's me. And, and, and one thing I've learned in my, in my career is that sometimes it's easier just to do something um, than to train someone to do it. So for a little while, there'll be certain things that I'm going to do, but there's certain things I know I cannot do anymore. Um, I can't program everyone's phone anymore. I have to train someone to do that. So there's going to be certain things that, that I have to start handing off to some folks, um, but I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to, you know, to train someone to do that. Thank you very much. Okay, then we're going to move on to the next section, which is management. And Chris, you're going to lead that. Sure. This touches into technology a little bit, but mostly uh, managing staff. Uh, if the district were to, say, decide to purchase online curriculum, and you had a large percentage of teachers that were really resistant to that uh, change, how would you go about cultivating buy-in? Sure. So when you say online curriculum, you're thinking of 
um, uh, like no textbooks? Is that what you mean? Uh, really, I'm thinking of, and I'm using this as an example here, but uh, a noticeable and uh, large shift in the way sure. the day-to-day -day class gets run. So to me, that's a that's a large shift. And I'll use your example. Um, that would never happen overnight without buy-in from the teachers first. And so I can say to that specific point, since I got this job in 2010, I've been laying the groundwork for we don't know what a textbook's going to look like in five years. We don't know what, you know, everything's going to computer. We don't know what a computer's going to look like. I'm sorry, a newspaper's going to look like. So I think we've laid that groundwork. I think you start in small groups and you pile it, right? And, so you, you, and, and then you build success. So we've done that. With our math adoption at the schools, we did not purchase textbooks at the high school. We purchased what, what, they, uh, what the math teachers came to me and said was, we're going to take this program, but can we just get a couple of extra carts of Chromebooks? And we, we believe that we can now use the online materials and use those tools because part of what we did in our pilot program was we want, when we looked at technology, we didn't just want to see um, an online program that was just a PDF of the book because that's not really technology. That's just, it's calling it technology. Technology is interactive. It gives back. It allows you to do things that you couldn't do with a traditional piece of paper. Um, and so we bought some books because we know that some kids are going to need a hard book and there's always those situations, but we did that. So we had that experience. So again, if, if teachers are resistant to it, I would be able to now say, well, it's worked really well in math. Let's talk to some of those math teachers. Let's look at that. And again, it would be part of the pilot program. So that decision to purchase the textbooks or to make that shift would be part of our ongoing pilot. And, and one of the criteria, like when we developed a, um, we had like five or six different uh, sections, each with three or four questions in it. One of them was just about technology. So when we looked at our programs, we, we looked at, is this fully online? What could that be? So with the elementary math program, it's Eureka Math. And one of the things with Eureka Math is it's Engage New York, which is completely free. You could just print the whole thing online and, and do the PDFs. Our teachers came to us and said, you know, we really don't want to print it, even though we could. Some of us might want to, but we do want to have the books. And so we went into that idea with knowing, for now we're going to buy the books, and every year we're going to kind of revisit that and see where we're going. But we involved teachers in that discussion all the way. And one of the things we did as we piloted was we said, we're not going to um, get something just because it's the least expensive alternative. We want to make sure that it's the right alternative. And if we're going to purchase something, we want to make sure we can sustain it. For a long time. So when I think about our science program, that's something that we, uh, you know, no Adam science at the elementary school. We spent several years mapping out and coming to school committee year after year after year and saying we need to allocate this X amount of dollars every year in the budget for science because we didn't want it to be at some point where we just said we can't afford this anymore um, because of because of a budget cut. So we before we made the decision, we made sure it was the right program and we made sure that we had the money to sustain it. So I think. Um, that shift away from text, I think we've seen more resistance. I think by now people thought we'd all only be reading Kindles and only be reading our newspaper online. I think there's definitely a huge shift. But you hear from a lot of people there's still a real need for some pencil and paper. So I think we're not quite there yet as far as that goes. And I think the next few adoptions, so as we're looking at social studies right now and folks are asking about textbooks, my answer is there's so many resources out there and there's so many ways to access this information. It's really not a textbook, but even the concept of a textbook coming from a publisher is, is changed. So what we're looking for are resources, supports. That's how we're going to spend our dollars. And the learning is going to be better for it because kids aren't sitting there just reading a book. But again, arguing with my brother, Textbooks have a lot of value, and they, and they do have some good information. And a, a good textbook can be set up with these different pieces. So in our foreign language program, when we adopted a book, they adopted a textbook that had interactive. So there's, there's definitely a place for that. But again, I think um, when we look at curriculum, we always stick to the curriculum is the standards. The curriculum is a pro it's not a program, and it's not a book. So when we look at an online program, it's going to be because we all felt, as a collective, our curriculum leaders, and all the teachers who are involved in the pilot have given feedback that this is the best choice that we're making. So I think because of that, you're going to have some buy-in. So it wouldn't be really an issue. It's not going to be a top-down decision. Um, it's going to be one that's made through a, a really thoughtful process. OK. So why don't we move on to community engagement. Janine? <clears throat> um, I'm sure you've kind of run across this in the past. Um, increasingly debates happen on social media concerning the school-related issues. 
If you heard of an issue arising on the so social media, how would you address it? Sure. So <clears throat> communication is, is so key and it's so important. And having the right information out there, I think, is the most important thing. And, and we've talked for many years. When I came into this position, um, you know, we, I think it was right around when Facebook was becoming much more popular for folks of, of my age, <laughs> as opposed to the younger students who now don't use it at all, right? Um, and, and I think Twitter was just starting to become, I remember when I first started using Twitter in, in, in my graduate class with students, I allowed them to make a fake account you know, I created a way to do it in a wiki, and then they also could use Twitter because no one wanted to, whereas nowadays everyone just uses Twitter, right? So it was really at that dawn of that, and people didn't know how to use it and what it was for. What you see now, and I'm, I'm one of these, I'm sure there's a North Reading page, I have like, you know, my Boxford parents page, my Boxford residence page, and things will blow up there. And, you know, we've talked, the, the question has been out there, should North Reading schools have a Facebook page, a Facebook presence? Um, we've, we've embraced Twitter, and we've embraced it as a one-way communication tool. We certainly have also embraced Twitter as a learning tool, but that's another conversation. But as far as a communication tool, it's a one-way. We push out cancellations, we pu push out information, we pu push out correct information. Um, but we've reserved um, the proper channels. And, and what that is, is we still have those traditional methods, picking up the phone, making a phone call, even an email, but a phone call or a face-to-face -face meeting is the best way to get, to get good information. And I think what you sometimes see blowing up on, on social media, if the, the person who has the question hasn't taken those other channels first to get that correct information, to engage in a conversation is not really the best way. And, and I think the best way to communicate is, and, and I know this has happened in the past, is to say, have you called the school yet? You know, so, and, 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 parent, and parents will go on there and say that, because if you call us, we're gonna answer that phone. I, I am, you know, my wife understands, my kids understand. I answer my calls instantly. I think that's something you'll ask anyone. I get back to people very quickly. I'll respond to emails. I'll always respond to calls, at, at the very least within 24 hours, but we'll get back. To me, that's the key way, because, to engage in a conversation. If I were to go on social media um, and jump into a conversation, one of the dangers of social media is you post something, you go away, and you, and you, you wake up the next morning and there's 35 other pieces there. And it goes and it, it can very quickly take off in different directions. So we've sort of agreed as a district to not engage in that piece. Um, and to, you know, I think it's important to be aware of it. And I think the, the important, there, there are plenty of people out there who are, quick to notify us, hey, guess what's blowing up on social media right now? And I think some of the school committee folks and some others are involved. We, we certainly will intervene, and we appreciate those tip-offs, and we will get involved. Um, and I, I think I would continue sort of the current practice of that that, that, that uh, John is, has put in place and that Kathy put in place before that, of not really engaging in the debate, but encouraging people to take the proper channels for social media. Um, I, I, you know, if I, if I was told I had to create a Facebook page, I would possibly do that and have a, you know, more of a communication tool. But I think I think it's been the right move. And, and you know, Facebook and Twitter are sort of still the main tools, but there's so many tools out there. It, it makes you start to question, you know, why do we engage in this one and not that one? There's another whole piece of this too that I'm very aware of with you know, public records laws and archiving. That's another reason why I'm very glad we don't engage in some of these things because there are not really good ways to archive those things. And just like email needs to be publicly archived, so does your social media presence. So the less that we engage in those forums, the less that we have to worry about how the heck that's all gonna be archived. We have a system in place to archive our emails, but that's another whole piece of it as well. Um, so there, there are new tools coming out every day. There are, new, there are tools that alert you to things that are coming up in the news. I have a, a system on my phone that, that I'm, I'm sorry, on my email that tells me if something comes up with certain key words. So I'm kind of tuned in to what's out there and, and I can respond and, and I've noticed those things as they come up. Um, but we, like I said, we have a watchdog network of parents and, and, and administrators that are, that are te keyed into it and saying, hey, by the way, this is blowing up. And you do need to respond quickly. You do need to get out a message using our Blackboard system, using our, you know, our, our website that has the ability to check. We have good communication tools, and I think as long as we're using those tools, um, I, think, I think that's what's most important, because if you're on Facebook, not everyone's on Facebook, so if I put something on Facebook, I don't want to say, well, I, it was on Facebook, right? Because if someone's not on Facebook, now they're not getting the message. Everyone needs to know 
Blackboard is going to come in, put your cell phone in there. We can text you. We can send you an email. And also, if you subscribe to our website, you're going to get our important news and announcement. I think those two channels are still the best way to go. You get our North Reading app. That's going to get you that, that information as well. So those are the best ways to engage um, with social media, I think. Perfect. Thank you. Um, can you give us some um, of your experience working with the police, the fire, and the parent organizations? Sure. Um, this is one of those places where I, I feel like I can just hit the ground running, and that's that's a, a great um, advantage to, to, to me as, as a candidate for superintendent. I have relationships with um, our current SRO. Um, just last week, we, we cope. Uh, we have a, a system for emergency notifications that we trained our paraprofessionals. Uh, he and I work collaboratively on a, on a PowerPoint presentation for a half day. Um, we've had, uh, in a good way, a lot of the SROs are here for a year or two, and they move on to some other positions. So there are a lot of current uh, folks in the, in the department that I've had very close relationships with as SROs over the years. Um, we, we did a, a comprehensive um, exploration of uh, I'm very confident that, that we've explored every program there is right now about school safety um, and technology. And I, I've sat there with uh, Chief Murphy and with some other officers, and we've, we've worked on this for several years. And we're, we're confident with our choices that we've made. But again, those relationships between us, I think, are, are, are excellent. Um, and, and I feel like we have a great relationship. Same with the fire department. Um, we're very uh, collaborative, and we work together on, on many different things. I have been. Um, as, as a member of the uh, emergency operations team, I've been brought in to um, advise on different pieces of the school, certainly on the school safety part, certainly on uh, some of the impacts to various pieces that I'm an expert in. And so I kind of came into the room and into the conversation as a second lens for some of those pieces of, of that as well. Um, so police, fire, was, did you ask about town management also? or um, No, just... Well, I should have, but... Par parents or... <laughs> parent organizations. So, yeah. yeah, so in parent organizations, I've been involved. John's done a great job. And, and you know, as he mentioned in my letter, he really has brought me under his, his wing in many ways. And, and sort of, he saw me as an aspiring superintendent and always wanted to, to uh, you know, so many people have done that with me here in North Reading, but John certainly has. And so he's brought me into several parent meetings. I've met with his parent council several times on many occasions. Um, I've engaged with the community for, for many years in our pause group, our pause and our wellness groups, which involve many stakeholders and parents from the community. Um, this year, just another example, I led the school start times exploratory committee, which was a great uh, you know, cross section of school personnel, school committee, um, and parents, teachers, everyone was on that group together. And I think it's so important to inv these major decisions to involve all stakeholders right from the outset. We had a, uh, a represented from the teachers group, um, even though we're, we're many years down the road or, or you know, possibly from, from even making a decision at the time, you want to get people in the, in the seats right from the get-go to be involved in the conversation. And so um, you know, I think one of the keys to parent engagement is figuring out not only how to engage parents, but how to engage all parents and how to engage those hard-to-reach parents. You know? So I'll just say one of the examples that I try to lead by example through our eval system, that's one of the pieces where our teachers um, have to demonstrate evidence. And one of the pieces that I always give feedback on is showing me that you're emailing parents is great, showing me that you're using Twitter, that's great. What we always want to think about those, where are the hard to reach parents and how are we engaging those folks? So I think as a superintendent, that would be one of my goals as well is to say, you know, I can't always be preaching to the choir here. How do we get some of those parents or those struggling students, what are the incentives to get them present and get them more involved too? So that's another, you know, piece that I would really work on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The next topic is the budget, and that is my topic. So sure. <clears throat> the first question is, so everyone has a, st a strategic plan that they're trying to implement. And the challenge of that is, of course, funding. So how do you implement a strategic plan when you constantly are getting level services funding, or, or even worse, some years? Yeah. So one of the things I'm most proud of, I think, in this district since I've been here is we, we really we haven't had any kind of layoffs of teachers, right? So we, we, we've made a commitment to keeping those class sizes at a, at a good place, um, even some of those really tough lean years. There were, there were years where there was a graph up on the board and it was a big dip, and then there was a nice arrow coming out of there. And every year that same graphic was up there. I'm like, aren't we supposed to be at the top now? Um, because there were, some, there were some tough years there. We are, we think outside of the box in North Reading. You know, I, I always describe North Reading as, you know, we are, we are, um, 
we're not one of the, you know, we're, we're actually pretty low poverty. Okay, so we don't qualify for very many grants. We don't get a lot of money through grants. But we're also not a huge industry base, so we don't have a lot of, you know, everything that happens in this town is coming from our taxpayers, right? We don't have a market street, <laughs> you know? We also, uh, we don't have, you know, when we toured some schools, I said, oh my God, this is such a beautiful uh, science building. Where'd you get it? Oh, private donation. We don't really have that either, right? So we're kind of in the middle, and that's how I describe it. So again, what I said is, the things we do have that we celebrate, we have this amazing school. We have, we've constantly, we've, we've found creative ways, outside the box ways to introduce electives, ways to keep going back to the drawing board. Like I said, we didn't get a digital learning director, which was too bad, but I said, here's a way we can maybe change this position, change that position, and I was able to get three positions. So I said, okay, we don't have our director yet, but here's our three teachers. You know, that's just one example of how we did that. Our administrative council team is so collaborative and, and there's no egos in the room. We all say what's best for kids and we all come together to, to prioritize. And we talk about this so often. And when I say that Michael, John and I talk about this often, um, every morning, before every meeting, after every meeting, we, we're constantly brainstorming ways to, um, to make things happen that we know need to happen. Okay, so when there is an opportunity for a cut or a restructuring, we've thought on every possible avenue, and we really know what the priorities are, and we're going to fight to support those. And we know those areas that are a little bit of, it's a, you know, I don't want to say a wish list item, but it's part of our strategic plan, it's part of our goals, but if that has to get pushed down a year to make sure that something that's essential doesn't get cut, we're going to do that. And that's what's so great about the way we operate and the way our strategic plan governs what we do, is that you know, we're not going in different directions every year. We're, oh, we went down this road and now we're gonna backtrack and now we're going down there. We keep chipping away at that, that vision for that plan and, and we've moved forward. Um, you know, I, I think teachers um, sometimes don't understand about those cuts to the operational budget. And I think it's a credit to our administrators who have managed it. I was talking with a teacher the other day who said, my budget hasn't increased and the cost for the materials has increased. My budget hasn't increased in years. And I said, but step back for a second, big picture, if you didn't see a loss, because the principal is bringing back a 5% cut every year, right? So he's balancing that across all the different departments. Um, so if actually, if you're not seeing a loss, that's actually a pretty good thing. But you know, we do need to start recognizing that you, you can only go so far, and, and we, we need to start increasing in different areas as well. Um, and, and I do feel, you know, my, my opinion from where I sit, I felt like this was a pretty good year. I felt like you know, things came together, and I feel like we're, we're certainly heading in the right direction you know, um, as far as budget. I think the finance planning team, that concept, um, as I mentioned in the other interview, when I when I describe that process to people in other districts, they're writing it down. They're like, "Wait, two members of this, and two members, you know." So having the two members of the of the, of the school committee, the finance planning team, um, the selectmen, the town administrator, the business administrator, uh, you know, Michael's there, John's there. Um, like I said, before that meeting, after that meeting, I'm a part of those meetings too. We're brainstorming, we're debriefing. But that process is so thoughtful, and, and the fact that there's, there's no surprises, right? We're all, in the town has a strategic plan, we have a strategic plan, we're all working together, we're all working with that same, you know, we're working from that same pie. Um, I think that, I think there's some, some great ideas there, and, that, and, and I think I have some new ideas to maybe even make that process a little bit better and a little bit more efficient. Um, I'll, I'll be, you know, I would be slow to bring about change, but I have some ideas. Um, but, but overall, I think that collaboration right from the outset, like I said uh, at, at the last interview, the budget process already started for next year. You know, we're already talking. We already know where we're going. We already know our priorities, and there's not going to be any real surprises, and we're kind of committed to our vision. And so um, I'm very confident that we'll get there. So um, just Please. one second. I want, to, I want to follow up on that one because I don't want you to stop on that Please. one part because yeah. – for obviously finance planning, um, you know, John and, and Michael are there yeah. consistently. It's nice to hear that you're working with them, but I would like to, I, I would like to push a little bit and see yeah. what are some of the ideas about how it would change? Because my first question was going to be, how involved are you with it early on in the process? Sounds like you're there a lot, Yeah. but how, how do you see that expanding and changing in, in the next few years? Sure. So, um, I, I guess my ideas are just more, you know, I, I feel like I, I don't know quite the history, but I feel like that group came about maybe 10, 12 years ago. Um, and I think, you know, there were some ideas about when town meeting was and how things were shifted and things like that. Um, 
these, these aren't necessarily groundbreaking ideas, and I know they're ideas that have probably been discussed before, but I think sometimes there's opportunities for some sharing um, of positions in some ways. I think sometimes that's a great idea, sometimes it's not such a great idea. But I think if there's ways to think about how can we work together um, and, and to, to identify things, I, I think that I think the town and the schools do a great job of, of um, communicating early and often, but I think we can be very strategic about, um, you know, some of those meetings I know we come away with um, not as much, it doesn't get as advanced, the football doesn't get down the field as far as we might want to at that particular meeting. And maybe we can be a little bit more strategic about how we have some of those meetings. So like I said, as a new superintendent, I wouldn't start changing things for a while. But as I listen to the stories, and, and maybe maybe once I'm in the room, I'll understand a little bit better. But some of my thoughts are just, you know, we've got some of the, the greatest minds in North Reading here figuring this out. And I think we can, we can really think about um, ways to be strategic about positions. And, and I, I think that might be uh, an inroad to think about if we can take this job and this job and maybe there's some cost sharing, I don't know, that's, that's one idea that I had, right. yeah. Well, let's be clear, since I was there, it was not all great minds in the room. <laughs> there were some. First thing that popped into so, my head. I, I know everyone was thinking it, so I'm just saying it. Chris, go ahead. That's actually what I was gonna ask. Okay, well done. Very good. Okay, so why don't we move on to the next section, leadership and vision, Diana? Sure. Um, so our first question in this area is about school culture. And so how do you feel the superintendent impacts school culture? Sure. I, I think the superintendent is, um, is key to that culture. I think the superintendent sets the tone for the, for the entire district. Um, much like the principal sets the tone for the building, I think the, the superintendent is sort of the, the leader of the leaders, right? And so I, I believe in accountability, and I believe in educator evaluation as a system. And to me, that's one of the biggest things that I would do is really look at our system, which, again, I think is really good and working well and make it the best it can possibly be. I, when, when educator evaluation reform was happening around 2010 or so, um, as a part of the Race to the Top initiatives that came out, I said, in my career, this is going to be the one shot to get this right. Because as a teacher, you know, I got evaluated twice in 10 years and the, you know I have all those kind of stories too and was the feedback meaningful did it really change what I did you know all those pieces so I said if this is coming from the government at the national level adopted by the state I want to be involved and I it, you can ask folks at the Department of Ed I went to every single meeting for every piece of this thing North Reading's opinions that I collected from our teachers is in that rubric it's in the staff and student feedback it's it's in there and it's in a lot of the revisions i was on the committees for the revised rubrics that we now have um and and we got more social emotional learning in there so my point is i think the best way to do this is to really think about how we set our goals i think good proper goal setting and good calibration of how we evaluate administrators the goals of our schools and the goals that our teachers are setting if we can align those and this this happens now there's alignment we have our our district plan we have our teacher goals but i think we can do an even better job of really holding ourselves accountable um I, i've recently met with a, a subgroup of ed eval committee and, and one of the things that's been passed along is the, some of the principals still need more calibration, not just in our observations, but how we're assessing what exemplary teaching is, what proficient practice is, what uh, a great idea is. And I think that cultural piece, um, you know, I think we can do, uh, to me, one of the things that I, I would be most excited about with this job is those relationships that I would build with the principals to really, to really look at our school improvement plans and say, are these goals measurable? Can we really, what is the evidence that we're doing this? Because you can kind of have goals in there every single year that, yeah, well, we worked at that and here's the things we did, but did we really achieve it? Was this the right goal? Did we set the right target? So one of the things that we're, we're looking to launch with at the teacher level is a focus on the goals. You know, not a focus on this whole system, but a real focus on student learning goals, how we set those targets and how we make them measurable. Professional practice goals, how we set those goals and how they're measurable. I would make sure we're doing that at the teacher at the principal level as well and holding those schools accountable. And to me that's where the culture will come from because if we have if we're goal driven and we're driven by uh, the the results and making sure that 
everything we do, no matter what, what I would say over and over again, two things that will probably get me in trouble as a leader. One, one is, um, you know, are we doing this for the kids, All right? So, so putting everything else aside, is this in the best interest of students? That's the first question we always have to ask. The second question that, that might get me in trouble is, I'm going to say, is this what the greatest districts do? Right? And I, I could see that coming back as a leader, someone saying like, well, is, let's compare us to the greatest districts in this respect, in that respect. But, I, but I'm willing to, I'd be willing to take that on because to me that's the question that I would want to answer all the time is to say, and, and, and I'd be okay with that if someone threw that back and said, well, is this what the greatest districts would do? Because that's what I want to be. And I think, um, I think it was actually when I met with you, Chris, <laughs> when you first came into the role, you said, how do we compare to this district and that district and this? To me, that's, that's what it's about. It's, I, I want to be in that conversation and we're getting there. I'm telling you, when I go out and people, people are talking about North Reading um, in ways that they, they, North Reading's always been good, but people are talking about the things we're doing here. People are always pointing to us and, and asking us to present. And our teachers are going to the state house for our robotics team a few weeks ago. Um, we, we are one of those elite districts. And, and what do we need to be to be great to be there? And I think the superintendent sets that tone. That's a culture that we want. We have excellence on our seal. That's what the superintendent has to uh, has to provide. John Bernard, I think, has done an unbelievable job of this. You know, the, the, the feel of this district, that, that um, hometown feel, that, that personal relationship, John standing and greeting kids in the morning as they come in and saying goodbye. I mean, that, I'm so in awe of that and, and I admire that so much. To me, that is the kind of tone that everything else I've just said doesn't matter unless you have that kind of a relationship with everybody. You know, you need to be someone that the teachers trust, that the parents trust, that the students trust. If you can set that kind of tone for the district, that shapes culture. Um, my dissertation is about culture and innovation, and so I know uh, I've spent a lot of time on, on this uh, from that level as well. The best thing to do is not to do something top down, but to plant those seeds and encourage people to cultivate. And so I'm constantly saying, don't do this for me. Do it because you believe in it, right? No matter what it is. And that's what the superintendent, that's what I would do as superintendent is cultivate that kind of environment. Thank you. I, I, have, I have a follow-up, and you started to touch on it at the end there. And it, it's a comment and a question. But I think one thing that I think our current superintendent does phenomenally is cultivate relationships with people and with students. And I mean, <clears throat> I've never seen a superintendent do what he does. And my kids and they're in elementary school before I was on the school committee, they knew who Mr. Bernard was, Yeah, you know, and in, and that was important. Now that I'm on the school committee, I get pictures when he's in there with, when he takes pictures with my kids. And yeah. so I, I guess my question to you is, you know, I know that you're going to look a lot at curriculum and things like that, but do you intend to try to follow in that role and do the same thing and put FaceTime in at each of the schools and walk around and try to learn the names of the different kids and interact with them? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, and I do. That's one of the things I look most forward to in this role. I, I like in my job now is sort of like Secretary of State. I get out a lot. I'm at a lot of meetings. Somebody has to go out and sit through the two-hour accountability presentation, bring it back, break it down, present it to you. I don't have the luxury sometimes of getting to be in district and, and, and walking around the, the classrooms. It, uh, unfortunately, I don't. I don't even get to, honestly, I observe 30 teachers right now, which none of my colleagues do. I love it. I wouldn't trade it. But I don't get to get into a lot of classrooms beyond the 30 people that I observe. And I, I feel like the best part of what I do is getting in their rooms, the relationships I've built with them, giving them feedback on their rubrics. I love going deep with those folks. I get to pass through. As superintendent, John gets to walk with the principals through the buildings all the time, see the kids, give them high fives in the hallway. I love that, and I miss that. And that's what I did as an assistant principal. Um, it, it, it's hard to believe those kids now are no longer in this district. They've now grown up and they're, they're moved on. But for those that knew me, that's how I was as a principal. That's how I was as a teacher. I got to hire one of my former students as a teacher here, so you can ask her. She'll tell you I was uh, I was one of those teachers that, that you know, got along with the kids, kids knew me, and that's, that's I look forward to that so much. Um, you know, I plan to be at events. I, I was saying to, to folks just recently, you know, I do have young children. Um, I, I love uh, being their coach. I love, I love working with them. I love seeing them grow up. I'm not gonna be, you know, I understand that this is a job, but I also understand the kind of job it is. 
My wife um, understands it as well. Her father-in-law, I'm sorry, her stepfather was a superintendent. She knows, we talked about it today, she knows what I'm getting into here. Um, and and the, way I would, the way I would approach this is, my kids already come to all the performances here. We go, we go to the games. We, we do live in the Masco district, but we still root for North Reading. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, you're going to be seeing my kids coming to games. My son just all of a sudden now loves baseball. He's going to be coming to baseball games, softball games, basketball games, theater performances, all that stuff. That's how we're going to do it because, you know, I, I said this in my interview for assistant principal here. I knew that my wife was the right person because we, we were dating at the time, and I said, how do you feel? And she was coming up from New Jersey, and I said, how do you feel about out of the two nights that we have here going to see a middle school play with me um, because some of my students are in it? And she said, sure. And she loved it. And not only did she go, but she actually enjoyed it. And we we still joke about some of the jokes from that show. But that was one of the, I just said, this this is this is the kind of person that, you know, you need to understand my relationship with, with this school district is going to be that way. Um, so I look forward to learning you know, all the students' names. I don't know that I can ever be John. John is just unbelievable um, in the relationships he has. He's told me secretly, he doesn't know every kid's name, <laughs> but he, he, he is unbelievable with that. And that's something I would certainly aspire to be. But right now when I go into classrooms, I say to kids, because they, sometimes they can't even visualize what I do. Superintendent they get, it's like the principal, but it's sort of the principal's principal, right? But I always say to the kids, well, do you like those iPads? Because I'm the one that helped you get those. Are those Chromebooks? Or, oh, you like your new math program? That's something that I've been involved in. Um, and I think a superintendent, they, they will see me and they will recognize me. And um, again, that, that's what I'm most excited about is, is getting in, knowing every single kid. Excellent. Very good. Other questions? I, I, I was going to let this go. I, I, I can't. <laughs> um, I've read Good to Great. Yeah. It's a very interesting book. Um, Couple of companies that I had. I apologize. I had to look up, look this up, make sure I got the companies right. But um, there's a couple of interesting companies in there. One is Circuit City, and we all. I mean, Circuit City is still around and doing fairly well. But we all know what happened to the, their business model. Kind of got pulled out from under them. And the other one that I thought was interesting was Wells Fargo, which um, uh, had man, uh, you know, the management team uh, go off the rails. You, you might say. I guess my point is, uh, how do you evolve, evolve uh, how do you avoid some of those pitfalls as you're trying to get to great or staying at great uh, uh, and not making it, uh, you know, avoid some of that risk? Right. I, and I work for Circuit City, so I can say, yeah. um, and Best Buy and Apple. Um, so no, but I, I think I think one of the things is you can't let perfect be the enemy. Um, I think you have to work with. Um, uh, allowing some risk and that's that's difficult in a job it's difficult I think it's difficult for teachers to take risks sometimes because if I'm a third grade teacher this is my kids only chance at third grade this is their only chance at that um, it's not like I can just you know if that if I lose that client I can try it again with another client it's different with kids um, and it's it's difficult to take risks and so what I always say to folks is take them in small you know small chances try try one lesson different if it doesn't work you don't have to do the, the next one the next day, but take those little chances. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to try something different. Uh, when we adopted a new math program, our teacher said to me, I hope you're prepared. I hope you're prepared for the grades to go down, uh, the, the report cards, because you know this is different. This is a big thing. And I said, I'll take that on. Uh, that's my, this is my responsibility. We, we selected this program. I believe in it. We're going to do great. School's now blue ribbon nominated school. I think we're going to do an OK. Um, so, Again, I think I think trying to be afraid of um, and that fear of we're already at a certain place. How do we how do we not go backwards? We have to in order to continuously improve. You have to take thoughtful risks, and I think that's what as a good leader you empower people to do that, um, and you support them, and 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 you you're clear that as the leader, hey, I got your back. If you want to try that, and it's a thoughtful, you know, and I think encouraging people to ask I get people all the time hey I'm thinking of doing this what do you think of that and I say that's good or well why don't you try it this way or maybe wait or wait a year or involve other people in that conversation but to me that's what it is I think if you hold back and um, and get frozen because you're afraid of, of failure you're not going to move forward and what's your BHAG I'm sorry what's your BHAG your big hairy audacious goal yeah I know it's been a while since I read that I I, I don't know 
Um, probably said it at some I th- point. Today. I think I think it's probably kindergarten. Yeah, <laughs> that's sort of that's that's a big one that's out there. But again, that's uh, I think that's something that's pretty exciting. And I, I think you know just to, to piggyback on that, that's that's one of the ideas that I have. Um, that I, I don't want to give away all my secrets yet. But I, I think I think along with kindergarten, I think I see some intersections with technology, start times, kindergarten, early childhood, daycare. Things like that. Um, I see a lot of opportunity there for some for some money making. Some are going to gain money. Some are going to lose money. But I think all those ideas kind of coming together. I think that is uh, something that's pretty exciting. It's going to take a little while, but I think it's one of those things that can make this like the ideal place to work. I think we have a, I think a great opportunity there in the next few years. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Daly. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. So at this point in time, I think we're going to take a five-minute break. We're going to then go into executive session yep. to conduct a strategy session in preparation for negotiations with the non-union personnel, superintendent. We will re- reconvene, and reconvene an open session at the end of the executive session. So but we don't know how long it'll be. We don't know how long it'll be. I don't think it'll be too long. But um, So we're going to take a five five-minute break. 10 minute break, and I think we'll have the we executive to? session probably here. So. Yeah, so great. You're all out. Move everybody out. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll walk you in. First of all, thank you, everybody that came tonight and sat through this. Yep, absolutely. I thank mean, you guys. It was you know, important. I mean, I know it's a, it's a long time, but I mean, it is it's nice to see people care and want to uh, be here. So thank you guys for coming. Um, so, in executive session, the one thing we just wanted to check on because obviously for an internal candidate, we don't have to do a site visit because we know the people we had references from them we just needed to see if we needed more information on the other candidates and i think we a majority at least felt in favor of making a decision tonight tonight i don't think we needed more and so do you want to make a motion rich or did you not want to discuss anything yeah we can i mean does anybody have any questions or anything or I mean, I think we yeah, I think we can get right into it. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean at the end at the end of the day, we thought that you know, we're very, as we said all night, we think the superintendent job is a very hard job, and you know, the search committee, which many of the people in this room were on, did a really good job of finding candidates and putting them forward, and they were very different candidates. And you know, I think some of them were better on paper than they were in interviewing tonight. And I think some of them were better interviewing than they might have been on paper going into it, but. I mean, at the end of the day, I think we've, you know, I mean, I know, I know, I thought Dr. Daly was great on paper yeah. coming into it, and I thought he was great. I thought he nailed the interview tonight, and as he said in going into it, I mean, it's not with him. We do have an experience, which is good and bad. There are reservations that we have about somebody from the position that they've had in the past. Everybody has weaknesses, and so when you have been here for ten years, you've seen their weaknesses more than somebody that you've talked to for one hour. But we've also seen the strengths, and I thought, you know, I had, I had, I had, and have a couple of main concerns, which we addressed tonight. Delegating, you know, being able to move on from a position when you're still here is going to be a concern, and making sure that you know you get out of the office and meet all the kids. But for me, that's not a reason not to hire him. I thought he did an outstanding job. I think he's a life, lifetime learner, and I mean, I think I'd be proud to support him as a superintendent. Other people have other comments? Do we want to? You wrapped it up pretty well. Yeah. I just think he's an absolutely stellar candidate, and he's a brilliant mind and an innovator. And I think he's going to continue to keep us where we are and grow us even further. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think this committee as a whole wanted to make sure that we looked externally as well because we didn't want it to be because we're going to take the person that's here because he's here and. I hope everybody understands that none of this is about that. This is about finding the right candidate for North Reading. You know, we are a good district. We have areas that we can still improve on. And we did an external search. We got the best three candidates tonight. And to me, it wasn't even a, it's not even close on that. And so, so can I entertain a motion to appoint Dr. Patrick Daly, the next superintendent of North Reading, contingent upon us negotiating a contract with him? I would be honored to put Patrick forth as our new superintendent. I have a second. I will second that. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Okay, unanimous. Congratulations, so. Patrick. Yes. Congratulations, Patrick. We will. <laughs> yeah, I'm awfully sorry. I will call him tonight and let him know. I will call. <laughs> I will call him tonight and let him know, and then we will begin the contract negotiations. And so, um, and hopefully, our next meeting is not till the end of July. I think. Correct. Yeah. Was that? Yes, January 2nd will be the start date, I believe. We'll confirm that. Um, but we'll try to, my hope will be, I think the uh, chair is supposed to negotiate the contract with them. So I think the, my hope will be that we can catch up in the next few weeks and get some terms down that maybe we can have something to bring to the next school committee meeting and, and we can start doing some planning. Yep. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have a motion to adjourn. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.